Welcome back to World Religions, a video series to accompany a semester-long survey of World Religions class. Specifically, these videos are to accompany the textbook, A Short Introduction to World Religions, edited by Christopher Partridge, but they would work well with any similar college course. In this video, we're going to look at Christianity. Uh, I've slightly rearranged the order of the chapters from the textbook, starting with chapter 37, Jesus, because that provides a more natural introduction before getting to chapter 36, the historical overview of the church. We're then going to look at branches of the Christian church or Christian churches, uh, sacred writings, i.e. scriptures, uh, main beliefs of Christianity, worship and festivals, and then we'll end with a look at Christianity today. This is just a brief survey, but hopefully it's enough to get you started. Chapter 37, Jesus. In order to understand uh, Jesus, the founder of Christianity, it's important to understand the Jewish concept of the Messiah. This is the English version of the Hebrew word Meshiach, which is translated into Greek as Christos, where we get the word Christ from. So um, Jews basically look forward to the reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel by the Messiah, which means anointed one in Hebrew. This refers to the ancient tradition of having a prophet like Samuel or a priest anoint the king of Israel. After the loss of the independence, the autonomy of the ancient kingdom of Israel, when it was conquered first by Babylon, then by Persia, then by a succession of Greek and other dynasties, Jews have looked forward to the restoration of the kingdom of Israel, which is promised to them by God through prophets such as Isaiah in the Hebrew Bible. In the first century AD, when Jesus lived, Judea was ruled in by the Romans. It was a province in the Roman Empire. Um, specifically, at the time Jesus was born, it was near the end of the reign of Herod the Great, who was a client king of the Romans, i.e. he ru ruled under their umbrella and paid tribute and owed other obligations to Rome. So a lot of Jews were very unhappy with this state of affairs. They wanted their promised land, the kingdom of Israel, to be independent once more. So Jews were looking forward to a Messiah and the followers of Jesus regarded him as the Messiah, and that's why they called him Christ. Um, the Gospels are stories of the life and teachings of Jesus. There are four of them in the Christian Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all give slightly different versions of events or focus on different details. According to Christian belief, Jesus was born not through a natural means, but through the Holy Spirit causing his mother, the Virgin Mary, to conceive. The idea of the Messiah being born of a virgin or a maiden goes back to an ancient interpretation of a prophecy that was in the Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh. So most Christians regard Jesus' mother, Mary, as having been a virgin at the time he was conceived. So he was not conceived by a human father, but by God, or specifically by the Holy Spirit. And in the Gospels, it talks about Mary being informed of this fact by the angel Gabriel. Angel is a Greek word, angelos, meaning messenger. And so these are basically interpreted as spirits who are created by God, but who give messages to people. So the angel Gabriel announced to the Virgin Mary that if she assented to it, she would be with child by the Holy Spirit. This is called the Annunciation. She did assent to it, and so um, after several months, she gave birth to Jesus. Um, according to the Gospels, uh, Mary's husband at the time, Joseph, they were newly married, was given a vision in a dream saying that it's okay that your wife has you know, not done anything wrong, has not been unfaithful to you, for example, but this is basically a miraculous event. So Joseph was a carpenter, probably from Bethlehem, because that's the town he went back to when the Romans did a census. And at some point, he moved with his uh, wife Mary to Galilee, which may have been where her family was from, uh, specifically the town of Nazareth. So according to the Gospels, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but he was raised in Nazareth in Galilee. This would have been to the north of Jerusalem. 
Um, so the Gospels give different details about the birth of Jesus. Maybe these are contradictory or maybe they're meant to be complementary. Um, but either way, according to modern scholars, he was probably born around 4 BC, just before the death of King Herod the Great. Now, the dating system used um, in modern times is based on a calculation of the birth date of Jesus. But most modern scholars think that the medieval calculation, um, according to which he was born in the year 1 or the year 1 AD, uh, Anno Domini, Year of the Lord in Latin, was off by a few years, and he was probably born closer to 4 BC. Um, so yeah, he was born in Bethlehem. Um, this may have been important because it was regarded as having been prophesied in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Um, but it's generally agreed that he was from, in some sense, Nazareth, um, probably because he was raised there. So there are different narratives in different Gospels about the um, birth of Jesus. This is called the Nativity by Christians. In Luke, it depicts Jesus being cradled in a manger in a stable and visited by shepherds. And the story is that his parents were traveling. They couldn't find a place to stay. And so when Mary gave birth, they had to have that happen in a stable. Um, there's also a story in Matthew involving three magi, uh, wise men or kings who came from the east. The word magi is Latin, um, and it is a word referring to the Magush, which was a tribe of priests in ancient Persia. These are usually interpreted as Zoroastrians, so they worshipped the god Ahura Mazda, but they were also famed for their knowledge of astrology. And according to Matthew, they see a kind of astronomical anomaly, uh, a star in the east, which guides them somehow to Judea and the birthplace of who they regard as a great king. Um, and there's also a story, Matthew, they tell Herod about this, the king of Judea, client king of the Romans, when they visit, and Herod is upset that another king is being born in his domain, basically, and he decides to try to kill all the newborn um, infants that are male. Um, and there's a warning given to Joseph and Mary about this, and they flee to Egypt to escape the slaughter of the innocents, as it's called. That story is only in Matthew. Um, there's also a story in Luke, the Gospel of Luke, that um, as an infant, this is when he was eight days old, according to Jewish custom, Jesus was circumcised in the temple in Jerusalem. By the way, about the name Jesus, it's customary for Christians to use that spelling with the Latin U.S. ending, which is the Latin version of the Greek Jesus. Um, even though this was actually just a Greek slash Latin version of a common Hebrew name at the time, um, which we would usually render as Jesse um, in English. But um, well, it, the Hebrew would have been Yeshua. But um, this is basically to differentiate Jesus from the other Yeshuas, which is a very common name in Judea at the time. So uh, little is described of Jesus' youth in the Gospels. Um, it mostly just skips from his nativity to uh, close to the beginning of his ministry, where he goes to John the Baptist, about which more in a moment. But there is a story in Luke when he was 12 years old, his parents lost him in the city of Jerusalem. The family was at Jerusalem because there was the Passover or Pesach festival, where all Jews who could make the journey were supposed to go to make a sacrifice um, at the temple in Jerusalem as part of this festival, which commemorated the liberation from slavery of the ancient Jews in Egypt, uh, connected to the events of the book of Exodus in the, uh, the Torah. So um, they're at Jerusalem, they're traveling with a large group of other people, and they think Jesus is with their group, but then they realize a couple days later, he's been missing for a couple days. So they look all around the city, they eventually find him in the temple, and he's basically engaged in a kind of dialogue or argumentative exchange or aggressive questioning, you might say, with the uh, priests and teachers that are in the temple. So the idea is Jesus, who didn't get an education in the Torah, in the Hebrew scriptures, he's still able to have this kind of unnatural knowledge of them. So you get the sense both from the birth narratives and the finding in the temple that Jesus is not just an ordinary human. And indeed, 
Christians believe that he is the Son of God as well as the Messiah. Jesus' ministry begins around the age of 30. Before that, he's described as a carpenter's son, so the presumption is usually he worked as a carpenter. But then um, he had a spiritual experience of the Holy Spirit when he was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a Jew who was trying to get other Jews to undergo a baptism ceremony where they'd be immersed in the River Jordan for purification. But he was trying to get them to uh, repent of their sins and to prepare themselves for the coming of the kingdom of God. According to the Christian versions um, of Jesus' baptism in the Gospels, John recognizes Jesus as the Messiah. Um, so when Jesus comes with other Jews to be baptized, John says he's the Lamb of God who will take away the sins of the world. And in Christian belief, um, Jesus, his uh, sacrifice through his death is what enables humans to be saved. There's a kind of theology of Jesus offering himself up as a sacrifice in place of the traditional sin offering in ancient Judaism, which would be a lamb or animal sacrifice at the temple. Um, but when Jesus is baptized, um, well, first of all, he insists that he still should be baptized, even though he is, in a sense, free of sin. He is going to save people from sin. He himself doesn't have sin. But when he is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends on Jesus like a dove. Um, and this is meant to be a kind of indication that, yes, um, Jesus is indeed sent by God to save humanity from sin and to help prepare them for the kingdom of God. So after his baptism, Jesus immediately starts gathering apostles or his inner circle of disciples, followers, preaching the gospel or good news, uh, basically of the coming of the kingdom of God. Uh, and then he performs miracles, healing the sick and casting out demons. The word gospel, by the way, um, can refer either to the teaching of Jesus or to one of those four books, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that are in the Christian New Testament or New Covenant. This is the part of the Christian Bible that was added to the previously created Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament or Old Covenant. And the gospel is from Old English, gold spell, meaning good news or good story. And it's a translation of the Greek, euangelion, or good message, good news. So what is the gospel? It's Jesus' teaching that the kingdom of God was at hand and that people could repent of their sins and be saved by turning to God. And the idea of the kingdom of God is a little bit underspecified. I think it's fair to say in the gospels themselves. But Jesus is clear that he is not establishing an earthly kingdom. It's some kind of spiritual kingdom in heaven that his followers will have access to um, after their death. So Jesus and his followers wander around Judea and surrounding lands, preaching mainly to Jews for about three years. Um, he taught to large crowds who would follow him around, especially after they saw him perform miracles like healings and raising Lazarus from the dead. He taught publicly, but he also taught privately to his inner circle of apostles, although some of those private teachings are included in the Gospels in the New Testament. Jesus uh, taught with, you could say, a vivid simplicity, using parables, and at least according to some of those who followed him, with an authority that contrasted with that of the priests and other rabbis or non-priestly teachers of ancient Judea. An example of his teachings is the Beatitudes. This is where he says a bunch of different categories of people are blessed, hence uh, the name Beatitude, which means blessed. But Jesus praises people that oftentimes are of lower status. He blesses those who are poor in spirit, and that could be interpreted as having a kind of humility. Poverty in spirit um, would be that you are have little you are lacking but it's portrayed as being a good thing so in spirit presumably means they're not puffed up with pride they have a kind of spiritual humility a spiritual poverty but jesus also often praises the poor in a material sense uh, and says that the wealthy have an especially difficult time of getting into heaven he says that those who mourn are blessed those who are humble etc etc 
So that's one of the themes of Jesus's teaching is trying to lift up those who are on the bottom end of social or other hierarchies. So his healings and other miracles are very interesting. Oftentimes he heals illnesses by casting out demons. This is connected to ancient belief that demons can cause various forms of physical and mental illness. And the mechanism of his healing would usually just be by a word that he spoke or a touch. Um, and he often said to people that your faith has healed you. Other miracles that he performed included walking on water, calming storms, etc. One of his first miracles uh, at the beginning of his public ministry is the miracle of loaves and fishes, where he feeds a vast multitude of people who are following him using only a small amount of bread and fish. So he's able to mystically multiply. And then uh, probably the most preeminent of his miracles, I guess if you had to rank them, was when a friend of his, Lazarus, dies when Jesus is not there. His family is mourning. They say, if you were here, you would have been able to heal him. They seem a little bit upset at Jesus, and they say he's been dead for four days. He's already been, he's already starting to smell. There's nothing we can do now. But Jesus goes to the tomb and basically is able to raise Lazarus from the dead. So Christians regard this as a kind of prefigurement of Jesus' own subsequent resurrection. So I mentioned the apostles. These are the 12 chief disciples, students, or followers of Jesus. And they were all male. They were of different ages, though. Peter, the oldest uh, and the most senior ranking. John, the youngest, who was just like a, a teenager or a young man. Um, they appear to have been from different segments of society as well. So one of his um, apostles was a zealot, who in later years were a faction who advocated armed rebellion against Rome. And another one of his apostles was a, a um, publican, a tax collector for the Roman authorities. So if nothing else, it's kind of symbolic of the fact that Jesus' followers included a cross-section of Jewish society, people from wealthy and poor families, people who were collaborating with the Romans and those who were advocating violent rebellion against them. And according to the Gospels, even before his arrest, trial, and death, Jesus told his apostles that he would indeed soon be killed. So Jesus had a multitude of followers, numbering in the thousands, um, who were devoted to him seemingly in large part uh, because of his miracles, his healings, as well as his teaching. But he aroused a lot of opposition as well. So there were different factions of Jews at the time and different sects. Not all Jews belonged to a specific faction, but these were political or other religious groups that were vying for influence and authority. The Sadducees were in a way the most powerful. They controlled the temple. They include the hierarchy of the priests, people born into the Levite tribe, that were um, educated and given the permission to perform the rituals and sacrifices at the temple, which was the center of Jewish worship at the time. And they also included other families in the ruling elite. The Pharisees were a different rival faction to the Sadducees. They were the rabbis or teachers and their followers who still would go to the temple to perform sacrifices, but they thought the main observance for Jews should not be temple sacrifices, but rather studying the Torah, the Jewish scriptures, and following the commandments or mitzvot. The Pharisees were the ancient ancestors or precursors of rabbinic Judaism, which is the type of Judaism mainly practiced today, and it became dominant after the destruction of the second temple in 70 AD. So the Pharisees were different from the Sadducees in other ways as well. They did not only accept the Torah or the five books of Moses as scripture, they also accepted as canonical or authoritative scripture other later writings, including the prophets, like the books of Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and others, and the writings, which were various other, including like the chronicles, historical chronicles, and so on. Um, and the Pharisees believed in the resurrection of the dead, unlike the Sadducees. This was something that had been promised in prophets like Isaiah. Um, and the Pharisees were also the ones especially looking forward to the Messiah. Well, Jesus in part um, uh, arose opposition to these, uh, arose opposition in these groups because he challenged the authority of the Sadducees um, seemingly to claim that he was the Messiah, the Son of God, sent by God the Father for some mission. He seemed to claim an authority for himself or to assume an authority that was greater than or challenge that of the priests, the Sadducees. 
He also was an enemy of the Pharisees because he appeared to break Jewish law by performing miracles on the Sabbath. Um, and, and also he angered and confused or frightened people by predicting the destruction of the temple. Um, but yeah, just in general, by claiming to be the son of God and the Messiah, that would have rubbed a lot of Jews the wrong way. Um, so for one thing, even though Jews were looking forward to a Messiah, they generally were not in agreement about who that Messiah would be. And they certainly did not all agree that it was Jesus. And by claiming to be the son of God, or having some special relationship with God, implying he was more than human, Jesus was really going against the grain of ancient Jewish thought. Um, this is something that apparently the prophets didn't really talk about. They did talk about the Son of Man, who's uh, usually equated with the Messiah, um, but that was not generally interpreted as being a Son of Man and Son of God, which is what Christians regard Jesus as. Uh, because he had a human mother, Mary, but also a divine father. So another reason why Jesus was controversial is he associated with people of low status or who were politically incorrect, I guess you might say, at the time, like tax collectors who collaborated with the Romans, for example, but also with sinners, people regarded as impure by a lot of other Jews. So the tax collectors of publicans were really looked down upon because they collected tax for the imperialist oppressors who occupied Judea, i.e. the Romans. Um, he would sometimes break bread with them, eat dinner with them. And the rabbis especially had a lot of purity rules about who you were allowed to eat with. It was considered impure to share a meal with sinners. And so that was one of their criticisms of Jesus. Jesus was also very critical of the wealthy and much more praiseworthy towards the poor. Um, so he said it's easier for a camel to get through the eye of a needle than for a wealthy person to get to heaven. So he was not making friends with the wealthy elites or the establishment. Another thing that would have um, rubbed a lot of ancient Jews the wrong way is that many of his prominent disciples were women, such as Mary Magdalene. And uh, this was, in general, a pretty um, patriarchal society. Now, it's true that Jesus did not have any female apostles, but a lot of his prominent other followers, including people like Mary Magdalene, um, who were financial supporters of him and his apostles, they helped pay for their expenses as they were traveling around preaching. A lot of them are women, and some of the most faithful and energetic were women. Um, also, the women in the gospel narratives play important roles in the story, um, although this would not have triggered initial opposition to Jesus because these roles um, happened during his death and resurrection. But the women were, for the most part, the only ones who stayed around him as he was being crucified by the Romans. And also they were the first to witness his resurrection. Um, Jesus's a parable of the good Samaritan probably would have rubbed people the wrong way. He was praising and associating with non-Jews, with foreigners. Jews regarded themselves as the chosen people, um, having a special relationship with God, and they looked at too much fraternization with non-Jews as potentially a source of impurity. So in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a Samaritan who was a member of another ethno-religious community related to Judaism but regarded by ancient Jews as deviant because they had a different version of the Torah, they didn't worship in Jerusalem, etc., um, the Samaritan was nonetheless praised for his virtue in the parable. So that would have been looked upon as kind of, you know, um, praising the enemy or this weird, impure, defective form of Judaism. And also Jesus, most of his early followers were Jews. He was born to a Jewish family. All of his apostles were Jewish. The vast majority of his disciples were Jewish. He mainly preached to Jewish people. However, um, he did have some non-Jews, even in his initial group of followers, including a non-Jewish soldier and a Syrian woman. So this might have been regarded as a bit strange or unseemly to ancient Jews as well. But here's this allegedly uh, alleged Jewish prophet who nevertheless was associating with foreigners. So Jesus... Uh, Rose a lot of opposition. He did have a lot of uh, supporters, though, who were passionate about him. Um, towards the end of his life, he entered into the city of Jerusalem to, in preparation to celebrate the Passover festival. So this is one of the three pilgrimage 
festivals of ancient Judaism where all Jews who were able to were expected to travel to Jerusalem to perform rituals at the temple. This is one of the ways that Jews were all united with each other was through all participating in these pilgrimage festivals. And there were three of them per year. Passover, in a way, was the most important. It involved an animal sacrifice. And it was calling back to the story in the book of Exodus where the Jews are able to win their freedom from their ancient slavery in Egypt um, as a result of um, escaping this 10th and final plague against the Egyptians, where the angel of death or the destroyer angel comes by all the Egyptian houses and kills the firstborn um, as a punishment for them for not letting the Jews go free by keeping the Jews in slavery. And the Jews are told uh, through the prophet Moses they can escape this horrible fate for themselves by sacrificing a lamb and smearing its blood on the doorways of the entry into their house. So the angel of death will know this is a Jewish house and to pass by it. So this is basically a festival commemorating the liberation of the Jews from slavery. And that's kind of like the beginning of their modern, or their their original identity as the nation of Israel. They're about to go into the promised land. Um, so Jesus is traveling to Jerusalem for this festival, and at first he's greeted quite enthusiastically. He's welcomed by crowds who say, Hosanna, praising him and offering him palm leaves. And he, ro he rode into the city on a donkey, probably be because this was, had been prophesied of the Messiah and some of the prophets in the Hebrew Bible. So a lot of these little details about Jesus from the Gospels, I mean, it is possible historically that he actually did all these things and that um, you know Christians regard that as evidence that he was the Messiah that was prophesied in the Hebrew Bible previously by people like Isaiah. But uh, scholars could also look at this and say, no, these details were added in there by Christians who wrote the Gospels because they wanted to fit the story you know, retroactively to make it seem like he... He fit all the prophecies. So after he enters into Jerusalem, though, things start to take a turn for the worse. He already has enemies, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, but he um, kind of causes a scene where he goes into the temple and he attacks traders that are buying and selling in the courtyard. And this angered the Jewish authorities who were controlling the temple. Um, the reason why there was so much buying and selling going in the courtyard of the temple, partly related to the sacrifices that were offered there. So people would buy animals to be sacrificed, for example. They would also need money changers if they were coming from other lands with other coins. So there was a lot of things going on there. And Jesus is basically implying that it is not fitting. It's a desecration of the temple to allow these uh, mercantile activities to go on. It's supposed to be a house of worship. So he's acting, though, as if it's his temple, as if he has some special authority. So that really angers the priests. Um, so according to the Gospels, Jesus' last meal was a Passover Seder that he had or with his apostles. So the Passover actually hadn't begun yet. It was to happen the next evening on Friday. This would have been Thursday evening. But it's at least um, a quasi or as if a Passover Seder. Um, because during the meal, he basically says that the bread you're eating is my body and the wine you're eating is my blood. And Christians interpret this as um, a sort of reinterpretation, recreation, or transformation of the Jewish Passover Seder into what Christians would call the Eucharist or Holy Communion. So this is one of the central Christian rituals where they eat bread and wine, which they regard as the body and blood of Jesus. And it's also symbolic of his um, death and crucifixion. Uh, so it's supposed to be him taking the place of the Passover lamb to be slaughtered. And his death is supposed to somehow save people who believe in him, um, save them from their sins. So Christians basically reenact the Last Supper in some sense whenever they perform the Eucharist or the communion ceremony. Um, and Jesus had previously talked about um, his body being bread that would be eaten by people and his blood being wine. And he even apparently lost some followers according to the gospels over this. And his apostles said, this is a difficult teaching, but he seemed really insistent that no, this is really important. He claims to have been able to uh, you know, predict that he was going to die 
and that his death had some kind of meaning connected to his teaching and how he was offering salvation to people. Now, um, according to the Gospels, Jesus was arrested because he was betrayed by one of his apostles, Judas. Judas was the one who held the money bag for the um, Christians. And so he basically, uh, according to Christian belief, was stealing from the money bag. And he also took a bribe of 30 silvers to betray the location of Jesus to the priestly authorities in Jerusalem. So he told them when Je Jesus would be at the Garden of Gethsemane. They are able to arrest him there. Peter, the eldest and senior of the apostles, initially tries to resist violently. He has a sword. He cuts off the ear of one of the guards. But Jesus tells him, no, this is not going to be a war. This is not, in a sense, going to be a violent revolution. And he's basically implying he is the Messiah, but he's not using violence to establish an earthly kingdom. Rather, he is establishing some kind of heavenly or spiritual kingdom. So the temple guards uh, arrest Jesus. He's taken before the Sanhedrin. This is the priestly council that has religious authority over Jews in Judea and elsewhere. And he's charged with blasphemy for claiming to be the Messiah and the Son of God. He is given a death sentence from the Jewish authorities, but they don't have the power to enforce the death penalty. Um, because they're under Roman occupation, the Romans did not give them legal permission to do that because they don't want an independent judicial power that can inflict the death penalty. So if they want to inflict it, they have to get permission from the Roman governor, who at this time was Pontius Pilate. So Jesus is brought, this is all happening late Thursday night, early Friday morning, basically, before um, the uh, Passover, which uh, the Passover begins Friday evening. So that's basically the, the holiest time in the, the Jewish year. And so the authorities are trying to get him tried and executed before the Passover because otherwise it would uh, there's not something they can do during the uh, Passover festival. It would be impure. So they take him to Pontius Pilate in the middle of the night um, and they accuse him of claiming to be the king of the Jews to get the attention of the Romans as a kind of rival or upstart or rebel. Um, so Jesus was flogged 39 times which was the maximum allowed under Jewish law. So it's a very severe beating, though. He's very weak physically by this time. Pilate interviews Jesus, and he does uh, admit, in a sense, to being or claiming to be a king, but he says his kingdom is not of this world. So after interviewing him, Pilate claims to have found no fault in him. But according to the gospel, he's then persuaded by an angry mob to sentence Jesus to death. So this is basically a, a mob of other Jews who are convinced that Jesus is um, blasphemous. And so because he's defiled their most sacred law, he deserves to be put to death. So Pilate agrees to sentence him to death. And the death in, uh, in particular was by crucifixion, which is a very slow, painful method of execution. This was usually reserved for their worst crimes. Um, Jesus was basically being accused of claiming to be king, so he's committing treason against the Roman Empire. And so that's why this type of execution would have been considered appropriate for him. Um, he was stripped of his garments. The soldiers actually, there were four of them, and so they actually rolled dice to determine who would get to keep his garments. Um, by this time, by the time the crucifixion started, he was already really weak from the flogging and possibly from other injuries as well. Uh, for example, according to Catholic belief, uh, when he was being forced to carry the cross to the hill where he'd be crucified along with some other criminals, he stumbled a couple of times and he injured himself thereby. And he was too weak to actually carry the cross and Someone else had to help him uh, carry the cross the rest of the way. Some of those details are in the Gospels, by the way. So um, the story is that when he was taken to be crucified, it was already getting later on Friday. And um, it could take days to die by crucifixion because it's basically you gradually asphyxiate. Um, and in order to breathe, when you're placed in this position with your arms splayed outward on the cross, you have to push up using your feet, which have been nailed to the bottom of the cross. And you're able to do this for a while, but eventually you weaken and you can no longer push yourself up to breathe, and then you gradually asphyxiate. So a very long, painful death. But Jesus, by this time, was already weakened so much that he died in just a few hours. Um, and in fact, because the... Um, the Sabbath and the beginning of the Passover festival was nearing, it was getting to be later on Friday, 
the Jews asked the Romans to make sure everyone was dead because it was considered impure and a desecration to have someone put to death during the Passover festival. And so they went around breaking the legs of the other criminals who were crucified. Um, there were people who were around Jesus who said he was already dead. And to check, a Roman uh, soldier pierced his side with a spear and blood and water, according to the Gospel of John, came out. So by this time, a lot of his apostles, by the way, had already abandoned him, including Peter, who had denied him three times before the cock crowed that morning, as Jesus had predicted. So basically, they chickened out. They were afraid when the law came down for their Messiah. The people who were still with them at the cross were some of the women and also John, who was the youngest of the apostles. One speculation I've heard for why John would have still been there is that because he was basically like a teenager, he was less likely to have been considered a threat and arrested by the Romans as being one of these rebels. So um, Jesus uh, speaks his last words. It is finished. He dies. Um, he's pierced. And then he's taken down from the cross where he's put onto a burial cloth. Um, and this is happening again before the beginning of evening on Friday. But they're trying to make sure he gets buried before Friday evening before the beginning of a Sabbath, the Jewish holy day, and before the Passover festival. And Joseph of Arimathea was one of his wealthier followers. He was the one who brought the burial cloth he had purchased and also had previously purchased a stone tomb in Jerusalem where Jesus could be buried. So according to Christians, the burial of Jesus in the tomb was not the end of the story. So this is actually why his disciples eventually come back to him, even though it seems that they had initially abandoned him. He is resurrected. And according to Christians, this happens three days after he's crucified. He's crucified on a Friday. He's resurrected early Sunday morning. So in our reckoning, that would be two days. But um, in ancient Greece and other parts of the ancient world, they would have counted that as three days, starting with Friday. Friday is one day, Saturday is the second day, and then early Sunday would be the third day. So um, during the Sabbath, no one is going to come back to the tomb because that would be considered impure to desecrate the Sabbath. So they wait. Uh, some of the women come back to the tomb early Sunday morning. But when they get there, they find that the stone that was to seal the entrance of the tomb was removed, and they go into the tomb and find it empty. And then they rush back to the apostles and tell them what, the, what they saw, apart from Judas, who's gone off on his own uh, and committed suicide by this time. But um, the uh, disciples, some of the, the male disciples, the apostles, uh, Peter and John run to the tomb and they find it empty except for the burial cloth and a face cloth. The face cloth may have covered Jesus's face after he was immediately brought down from the crucifix um, before he was placed in the burial cloth provided by Joseph of Arimathea. And so they're wondering what's going on. They're wondering if someone took their um, teacher, what happened to him. But then um, pretty soon Jesus starts reappearing to both his male and female followers. And this continues for days and weeks. So according to the Gospels, if you take them all together, several hundred people saw Jesus over a period of weeks. There's even one of the disciples, uh, Thomas, who expresses doubt that Jesus was actually raised and says he won't believe it unless he sees it himself and unless he's able to touch the side wound of Jesus that he must have heard about from uh, John, who was, uh, according to the Gospel of John, um, one of the eyewitnesses to Jesus being pierced. Um, but then Jesus appears to Thomas, and he is indeed able to touch the wound, and thus he believes after that. So um, after many appearances uh, for several weeks, then there's an event called the Ascension, where Jesus is observed by his followers ascending to heaven. The resurrected body of Jesus ascends to heaven. So according to Christians, uh, he's seated there at the right hand of the Father. 
So Jesus, uh, Christians, most Christians regard Jesus as God, as well as God the Father. We'll talk more about that later. But in any event, they regard the resurrection and the ascension as confirming that he was the Messiah. He was the Son of God. He was who he said he was, and as confirmation of his promises that people can be saved of their sins and have eternal life in the kingdom of heaven if they follow him. So uh, people disagreed, though, about who Jesus was. Uh, most of the Jews did not regard Jesus as the Messiah. Jesus is uh, mentioned in some later Jewish literature where he's basically considered to be a miracle worker or a magician, maybe a, sor a sorcerer, but definitely not the real Messiah, a false Messiah or a charlatan. Um, but the Christian view is that, yeah, he was the Messiah and the Son of God. And Jesus also said that he and the Father were one. I and the Father are one, he said. So one interpretation of that is that he just was God. He was one with God the Father. Um, and Jesus promised eternal life to those who followed him. So that's what most followers of Jesus would also expect. Um, in line with the uh, prophecies of Old Testament prophets like Isaiah, that there'll be a resurrection of the dead. And those who are judged righteous will have a kind of eternal afterlife, whereas those who are not righteous, who are wicked, will be destroyed or possibly be tormented. Uh, there's different interpretations of it. This picture, by the way, the photograph in the slide is from the Shroud of Turin, which some Christians believe to be a relic of the burial shroud of the actual historical Jesus, although that is controversial. Chapter 36, Historical Overview. Now that we've uh, briefly described the life and teachings of Jesus and a few of the main beliefs of Christians, we're going to give a brief historical survey of the history of Christianity. So after the death of Jesus is what's known as the Apostolic Church. So this is during the lifetime of his apostles. And they're the people that they had immediate contact with, uh, you know, basically the first and second generation of followers of Jesus. And according to Christian belief, the church began, church being uh, basically the, the formal organization um, or just the group of followers of Jesus, um, when the apostles received the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost as recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles. So this is originally a Jewish festival, but in a Christian belief, it becomes the beginning of the church and the beginning of the activity of the Holy Spirit in the church, which most Christians believe to be the third person of the Holy Trinity, that God is Father, God is Son, God is also Holy Spirit, and each of those is fully God. That's the standard um, Christian doctrine of the Trinity. They believe in one God, but they believe in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So one way of understanding the Holy Spirit is the um, God's presence in uh, believers. Um, and if I say anything more, it'll be too complicated or controversial. People disagree about what exactly that means, but that's generally agreed upon by Christians. So the uh, Apostle Peter was apparently given authority by Jesus to be the head of his church. So he says, for example, he's talking to Peter, whose actual name was Simon or Shimon, that you are the rock upon which I will build my church. The um, Aramaic word for rock is Cephas or Cephas, and this was translated into Greek in which the Gospels were written as Petros or Peter in English. So this name Peter is actually a kind of nickname or title that was given to the Apostle Shimon by Jesus uh, in order to indicate that he was going to be the head of the church after Jesus's death. Um, and the early church in Jerusalem though also had an important role played by James. Jesus's brother he sometimes described the word for brother could also be translated as kinsman, so we're not sure it was a full brother, a half brother, maybe a cousin, but some kind of relation to Jesus. And they became the leaders of the Christians in Jerusalem. Another important early apostle was Paul. Paul was originally named Saul of Tarsus. He was a Jew who was a Pharisee, an enemy of the Christians. He actually went around persecuting them. He thought that Jesus was a blasphemer, a heretic, and thus should be punished. Um, 
So Saul had a vision of Jesus on the road to Damascus and became a disciple of Jesus. And he accepted the new name of Paul to kind of mark or indicate the conversion. Um, and he became a big booster and missionary for the Christian community, which originally most or almost all the followers have been Jews. Paul started to go to the Gentiles or the non-Jews um, and preach the gospel to them. Um, because he interpreted Jesus's message of salvation as not only being for the Jews, but for all people. So early Christianity started to spread more rapidly among Gentiles than among Jews. Many Jews did convert to Christianity, but most did not. And pretty soon, most of their new followers were Gentiles. And it didn't take that long, probably less than a century, for the majority of Christians to have been from non-Jewish or Gentile families. So early Christianity was spreading fastest in the cities of the Eastern Mediterranean, especially among Greek-speaking people, but also among other ethnic groups like Syrians and Egyptians, for example. Um, in the early history of Christianity, they did start to spread pretty rapidly throughout the Mediterranean, so throughout the coastal areas that were part of the Roman Empire, um, including Rome itself. But their main centers were in the Eastern Mediterranean, in Jerusalem, in many cities of Asia Minor, what's now Turkey, including uh, the region of Cappadocia, Constantinople, which was a later um, Eastern Roman capital built by the Emperor Constantine, and other cities in Asia Minor like Ephesus. Alexandria, Egypt was another really important city for the early church, and Antioch in Syria. And the picture on the slide is of Paul on the road to Damascus when he has a mystic vision of Jesus. And that's actually what persuades him to convert to Christianity. He says that, um, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And um, Paul also says that he basically went blind when this happened and his vision was regained later. So this is kind of a mystical or spiritual experience that Paul interprets as a sign from Christ. And that's when he becomes a Christian. So the early church, you could say, is the church of the first few centuries of its history. And um, there were a lot of different ethnic groups that were part of the church, but probably the biggest group was speakers of Greek. Uh, so many of these would have been ethnic Greeks who lived in various cities in the Eastern Mediterranean and Middle East in this time. Um, and this is why the New Testament, or the part of the Christian Bible, that um, is unique to Christians, it's not also used by Jews, was written in Greek. It was written in Koine, or the common Greek spoken in this time. And Christians also used the Septuagint version of the Jewish scriptures. So this was an ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible made in the city of Alexandria, Egypt, um, by some Jews that lived there. Um, these were Hellenized Jews who spoke uh, Greek. So with the use of the Greek language uh, for a lot of the early Christian literature, not only the New Testament, um, there was a tendency to have people literate in Greek who knew Greek philosophy and Greek literature. Um, those ideas could sometimes influence Christianity, so, um, or at least the way it was interpreted and expressed to uh, people. So for example, the philosopher Plato, who was a Greek philosopher who predated Christianity by several centuries, but because he argued for a single universal principle who was or which was the source of all being and becoming, Plato called this the good. Later Platonists often called this the one. Um, this was interpreted by Christians as kind of anticipating or prefiguring the um, monotheism of Christianity. And especially some of the later Platonists, their interpretation of Plato was that this eternal divine principle had kind of two uh, emanations or kind of other levels of being that it led to uh, the world of forms. Uh, or ideas, which you could say, at least by analogy, are like thoughts in the mind of God, and the world spirit, or world soul, rather, 
which gives motion to the universe. Now, this particular formulation of it was from later Platonism, later followers of Plato. But the point is, um, these ideas, insofar as they resembled Christian monotheism and the Christian trinity, and there were other kind of parallels as well, um, could be used by Christians both to help explain their teachings to Greeks, including educated Greeks who might be familiar with some of the philosophy, and also to point to Greek philosophy as like anticipating some of the teachings of this new religion. Um, there were other communities of Christians besides the Greeks. There were Egyptians, Syrians, Romans, Armenians, Ethiopians, and others too. So it pretty quickly became a very kind of international religion uh, spread throughout the Roman Empire and beyond. So um, the Romans uh, were pretty suspicious of it and started persecuting Christians. One of the main reasons for this is that the Christians refused to participate in the imperial cult or worshiping the emperor as a god. This was done throughout the empire in part, large part as a political loyalty test. So if you were willing to make offerings to the emperor conceived of as a divinity, that showed you were willing to submit to Roman authority, basically. But the Christians refused to do that for religious reasons because they only worshipped God or Jesus. And so that was one of the things that made them enemies of the Romans. Um, there were periodic persecutions. Um, one of the bad ones was the Decian persecution of 249 to 251. The persecutions created a lot of Christian martyrs. So a lot of people in the early Christian communities were willing to sacrifice their lives for their faith. Um, this continued until Constantine, a Roman emperor, converted to Christianity. And the story is that he was about to fight a major battle, and he saw a vision that said, in this sign, conquer. And the sign was apparently a key row or a symbol of Christianity. These were the first two letters of the Greek word for Christos, uh, which means Christ or Messiah. Um, that's the way the story is often told anyway, and he uh, became supportive of Christianity after that, and he converted. He was formally baptized, I think, only on his deathbed, but he ended the persecution of Christianity in 313. This is called the Peace of Constantine. So Christianity had been growing very rapidly before then, and it just started growing even more after that. And within, before the end of the 4th century, Christianity had become the official religion of the Roman Empire. Um, during this time, the first few centuries of Christianity, there was a pretty rapid agreement on the scriptures, which ones were canonical. So this was the period of time in which the Bible, the Christian Bible, was formed. It was divided into Old Testament and New Testament. Old Testament was the Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible or the Jewish scriptures. The New Testament included the Gospels, the letters of Paul and other apostles, the book of Revelation. And these were early texts, mostly from the first century AD, regarded by Christians as authoritative. But nevertheless, there were a lot of doctrinal disputes among Christians about how to interpret the nature of God, for example. Was Jesus the same as God? Was he a lesser created being of God? If he was God, how was God also the Father? So a lot of this got hashed out in some of the decisions or texts promulgated by councils of bishops who were gathered from across the uh, Christian world. So one of the early uh, series of councils was several councils in Nicaea, and they were responsible in part. One of the things they did was formulating the doctrine of the Trinity, that God is one being but in three persons. And this is also related to the use of the Greek language because some of the terms they used, like usia for being, was from Greek philosophy, like from Plato and Aristotle. So this word usia could mean being or substance. It's a thing that exists on its own. So they insisted that God is one being, but they also insisted that there is three persons of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and neither one of them is superior to the other. Uh, one of the other early uh, church councils was the Council of Chalcedon, 
and this was debating the nature of Jesus. So is he human? Is he divine? Is he both? Is he like a mix of the two? Is he the two separately? So the conclusion of the Council of Chalcedon is that Jesus is one person in two natures, fully human and fully divine. With each of these councils, and there were others too, like Ephesus, not all Christians were on board, and this led to some early schisms from some of the ancient churches. By the way, the picture on the slide is a much later Orthodox icon of Constantine presiding over the Council of Nicaea. So um, initially, uh, most of the churches, uh, except for those in the East and some in Egypt and Syria, accepted um, all of those uh, councils. So there was one Catholic, which means universal, or Orthodox, which means right teaching church. But eventually, this original Catholic church, which included both Greek speakers and Latin speakers, for example, eventually it divided in two. The Western church, or the Roman Catholic church, and the Eastern churches, or the Eastern Orthodox churches. So um, this division was kind of a gradual thing, though. In part, it even goes back to the very early history of the church in the first couple of centuries AD. Insofar, there was already a cultural divide between the two halves of the Roman Empire. In the western half of the Roman Empire, which is all around the western coast of the Mediterranean, what's now like Italy, France, Spain, and North Africa, they mainly spoke Latin. In the eastern half, um, in a lot of the cities, they mainly spoke Greek. So the eastern half of the Roman Empire included mod what's now a modern nations such as uh, Greece, Bulgaria, Turkey, uh, Syria, Lebanon, uh, Israel, Palestine, Egypt. So all of those areas, they had other languages too, but Greek was very common in the major cities. So there were linguistic and some cultural differences there. Now, early on, um, the bishops of Rome claimed descent from Peter, the apostle, and they claimed authority over the other bishops within the church. A bishop is basically the chief priest in a city. They claimed authority over the other bishops because they claimed a succession from Peter. So they regarded themselves as Christ's vicar or representative on earth. And gradually, um, that papal supremacy was challenged by the Eastern Orthodox churches. And that was one of the main reasons for the split, but, but, not, but not the only one. So um, there were also differences created between the churches, East and West, after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire actually continued in the Eastern Mediterranean um, up until the 1400s AD. So for another thousand years, although it gradually lost territory to various Muslim um, empires. But um, the Western Roman Empire fell in the 400s AD. They were invaded by a bunch of German tribes who created kingdoms out of their territory. Um, the German tribes that controlled Italy let the Roman emperor still exist in theory, but the last Roman emperor, Romulus Augustulus, was deposed in 476 AD. So that's often taken as a kind of formal or at least symbolic end of the Western Roman Empire. Um, and so, in the absence of the Western emperors, the Pope, as the Bishop of Rome, actually became very important as a kind of cultural unifier for the Western Church. Uh, whereas in the East, they still had the Emperor in Constantinople, which was the Eastern Roman capital created by Constantine before. Um, in terms of the West, uh, monasticism was very important after the fall of the Roman Empire because the monasteries became one of the main cultural centers. The monks often specialized in copying the Bible and other books. They preserved a lot of the learning of the Latin West. Monasticism had actually started in Cappadocia and Asia Minor, and especially in the Egyptian desert. So they had monks and people living an ascetic lifestyle in Eastern Christendom, but they also had um, orders of monks in the West that became very important, even more important for the West at preserving the Latin culture. Um, and Latin remained the language of the liturgy of the Western church. And they continued to use like uh, vestments or formal clothing worn by the clergy that had a, a Roman style to it. So they just had a lot of features that were kind of descended from 
the uh, the western half of the Roman Empire. Also, another difference between the two branches of the church is that at some point, um, the western church started requiring ordained priests to be celibate so that they couldn't have um, wives and children. Whereas even today, um, there are some priests in the Orthodox churches that um, are married, although the general rule now is they cannot marry after they become ordained as priests. But if they're already married before, then um, that can be possible. So um, the Eastern Church, the Eastern Roman capital, Constantinople, became one of the main centers of Eastern Christianity. So the Patriarch of Constantinople had a kind of um, preeminence over the others, although they didn't claim the supreme authority over the whole church that the Bishop of Rome or Pope did. Um, the Eastern Church also used Greek in their liturgy, and there were other languages too, like Slavonic, um, an old Slavic language that was spoken widely in Southeast Europe at the time, was used in the Orthodox churches in the Slavic um, kingdoms. And so all of these cultural differences, the Eastern and Western churches gradually drifted apart. They didn't formally break until 1054 AD. This is called the Great Schism. And in addition to breaking over the issue of papal supremacy, whether the Pope has authority over all Christians, which the Western church or Catholics said yes, the Eastern church or Orthodox said no, they also had other differences, like a slightly different version of the Nicene Creed. In the uh, Western or Catholic version of the Nicene Creed, this is the official statement of Christian doctrine that came out of the Council of Nicaea. Um, it says that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. This is called the filioque, or uh, and from the Son clause of their uh, Latin version of the Nicene Creed. But the version of the Nicene Creed used by the Eastern Church didn't have that clause, and a lot of people in Orthodoxy claim there's a significant theological difference between their version of the Creed and the Catholic version for that reason. You can see uh, in the map, this is showing the uh, state of the two uh, main branches of Christianity at the time of the East-West or Great Schism of 1054. All the areas in orange were Catholic, areas in blue were Orthodox, and there's some areas of overlap. By this time, there were also other churches in the East. So, for example, the um, so-called Oriental Orthodox churches, um, those would have included Armenia and also um, Egypt, and the uh, churches of the East um, like in uh, Chaldea or Babylon and further to the east, so-called Nestorian Christians, although they didn't call themselves that. So there are already some previous divisions of the church as well, but a lot of those happened in antiquity with the early church councils. This was a much a later division, centuries later in 1054. You also note that at this time, um, most of Western Europe, or pretty much all of Western Europe is Christian. Most of Northern Europe there were still some non-Christian parts in the Northeast. The Estonians, the Lithuanians, and Prussians, those were later converted to Christianity in part through conquest by crusaders from um, the Eastern Holy Roman Empire and the Kingdom of Poland, that general area. Um, but yeah, so this was a huge moment in the history of Christianity, the East-West Schism. And uh, nowadays, uh, the Orthodox Church is kind of regarded as one church, um, but they do have a lot of independence for um, churches in different countries, largely. So they have different patriarchs. Um, and so they don't have a single supreme head, unlike the Pope for the Catholics in the West. In the Middle Ages, and we're going to mainly focus on Western Europe here, the Pope was very influential politically, not just religiously, for Catholics or Western Christians. Also, what happened during the early Middle Ages, which is very important for Christianity generally, was the rise of the new religion of Islam that started in the Arabian Peninsula. So Muslims, they actually agree with Jews and Christians about some things. They claim to worship the same God. They accept all of the patriarchs and prophets of the uh, Jewish scriptures. They accept Jesus as Messiah. They deny that Jesus is the Son of God or God. So they think they deny the doctrine of the Trinity. They believe in only one God. And they regard Muhammad 
uh, to whom they reveal their scripture, the Quran was revealed to be the last and the greatest of the prophets. So um, they had some things in common with Jews and Christians, but a lot of differences. And so they became a rival religion. And also they started to spread very uh, rapidly through conquest. So um, after the death of Muhammad, the first caliphate or sort of like a religious uh, state or government of Islam was the Rashidun Caliphate. And the Rashidun Caliphate was able to pretty rapidly conquer large parts of the Eastern Roman Empire as well as the Persian Empire. And in the period between 632 and 661, the Umayyads actually continued the conquest uh, further east and other places too. Um, their caliphate lasted from 661 to 750. So during that whole period, 632 to 750, Islam was spreading very rapidly throughout the Middle East, throughout North Africa. Um, and the one of the reasons why it was easy for the Muslims to conquer the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire is that the Eastern Roman Empire had been fighting wars with the Persian Empire for many decades, and both were very weakened. And also, they had kind of um, levied heavy taxes and been very burdensome on a lot of the people that they ruled. So a lot of the people that were part of the Eastern Roman Empire, the Persian Empires, were kind of happy when they saw the Muslim armies invaded. Some of them looked at the Muslim armies as potential liberators. So in any event, these lands, when they were conquered by the Muslims, they didn't like instantly convert to Islam. There were some um, conversions early on, but like Egypt, for example, re remained majority Christian for several centuries. But in all these areas that were formerly centers of the Christian church on the Eastern Mediterranean, like Egypt, like Syria, like Asia Minor, what's now Turkey, they gradually converted to Islam until they became majority or almost completely Muslim several centuries later. Um, so Islam actually went into Spain, so they started to advance into Europe. They were actually only defeated in the 700s by a Frankish or French king, uh, Charles Martel, um, and that kind of stemmed their conquest of Europe. Otherwise, who knows, perhaps all of Europe would have become Muslim. The uh, Franks uh, were a powerful Germanic uh, kingdom in what's now France and other parts of Western Europe. At this time in the early history of Western Europe, so we're talking about from around the 400s to the 700s AD, um, most of Western Europe that was Christian was Aryan Christian. They actually rejected the Nicene Creed. They had a different theology. They thought that Jesus, the Son, was a lesser person of the Trinity than God the Father. So they didn't really accept the Nicene formulation of the Trinity. This was based on the teachings of the priest Arius. But the Franks were different. They accepted the Orthodox or Catholic uh, Christianity. They became great defenders of the Pope. Charlemagne was one of the greatest kings of the Franks. He united a lot of Western Europe into a giant empire. He kind of regarded himself as a successor to and a recreator of the ancient Western Roman Empire, although unlike the former Western Roman Empire, his lands just included France, Italy, parts of Spain, parts of Germany, but not North Africa. Um, and, but nevertheless, he was crowned Holy Roman Emperor in Rome. So this is also the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire, which so formerly started in 800 when Charlemagne was crowned by the Pope in Rome and at least officially lasted until 1806, although by then the Holy Roman Empire was uh, pretty fragmented. Um, the emperors didn't have a lot of power over a lot of the land. But so yeah, the empire was a really important part of just medieval Western or Catholic Christianity because a lot of Christians regarded the emperor as kind of like at least symbolically the ruler of all of Christendom or all of Christianity. And he had a very close relationship with the Pope, although sometimes very um, uh, tendentious relationship. So another example of an important event in the history of medieval European Christianity was the investiture controversy. This was a dispute between the Pope and various kings and emperors over who has the right to invest bishops or abbots, who has the right to appoint these more senior ranking clergy throughout um, the Christendom or the areas that are Christian. And the Pope claimed that authority for himself but that was challenged by kings and emperors for a while. 
Um, and the uh, Reconquista was another important uh, event or really series of events in the history of Christianity in the Middle Ages. So at one point, Spain in southwestern Europe was entirely Muslim or ruled by Muslims. There were still Christians there and Jews as well. Um, but the uh, Spanish, there were a few Christian Spanish kingdoms in the far north, and they started to gradually retake land further and further south. And it only ended in 1492 when the last little part of uh, Muslim Granada in southern Spain was taken. So um, this was a long, gradual process, but it was kind of a big thing, especially for Spanish national identity of like pushing back the Muslims and creating a new a Christian Catholic kingdom in Spain once more. Another example of um, Christianity, like projecting military power during the Middle Ages was the Crusades. This was a series of uh, military campaigns, mainly from knights and nobles, some mercenaries and others from Western Europe going to the Holy Land and trying to take it back from the Muslims. So the Muslims have been ruling the Holy Land for a long time, but it wasn't really sparking the Crusades until the Ottoman Turks um, got control over Jerusalem um, and other parts of the Holy Land, which had been a main point of pilgrimage for Christians. And at some point, apparently, the way became difficult for Christians. Some of the Christian pilgrims to Jerusalem may have been killed or may have been uh, made unsafe. And so there was a twofold kind of justification for the Crusades. On the one hand, it was to protect the pilgrimage routes to Jerusalem, which was regarded as the most holy city by Christians in Western Europe. And also because the Christian emperor of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, so-called Byzantine Empire, had requested help against the Turks because they were taking more and more territory. Eventually, um, the uh, Byzantine or Eastern Roman Empire would be destroyed by the Ottoman Turks, um, but that would be centuries after the Crusades. By the way, I think I misspoke. I think I said the Ottoman Turks were the ones who were um, causing problems in the Holy Land. I think that may have actually been the Seljuk Turks at this time. The Ottomans uh, certainly didn't come to main political power until after. Um, but anyway, so these were uh, peoples from Central Asia, by the way, the Turks, who had converted to Islam. Um, and so that's why they would have been regarded as potentially problematic or enemies by um, some of the Christians in Western Europe as well as Eastern Europe. So the Crusades actually succeeded initially at conquering some of the lands in the Near East from the Muslims and establishing the so-called Crusader states, but they are eventually all dismantled and destroyed by various um, other Muslim dynasties in the South. Uh, so um, another important aspect of medieval Christianity was scholasticism. This is the philosophy of the schools or universities run by the uh, Western Christian Church. Um, so these were basically the main centers of learning in the Middle Ages. Important thing to keep in mind is that all of these higher education institutions were run by the church. And so oftentimes people would study theology along with other subjects. The greatest philosophers of the Middle Ages were also theologians, people like Thomas Aquinas and Duns Scotus. So after the European Middle Ages was the Renaissance. This started in Italy in the 1400s. You could argue it had precursors in the 1300s. It's a kind of diffuse cultural movement with literary, artistic, and other cultural and philosophical aspects. So it started as a group of writers and artists who had uh, kind of like a new aesthetic, but also a new ideology. On the one hand, they wanted to return to the classical sources. This is called ad fontes, to the sources in Latin, i.e. read the original works of the Greeks and Romans in their language, especially, for example, reading the Bible in the original Greek rather than the later Latin translation that was used throughout most of Western Christianity. But they also wanted to reread ancient Roman and Greek writers um, and model themselves not on the medieval Christian culture, but on the classical culture of the Greeks and Romans, which they regarded as more sophisticated, more aesthetically developed and so on. But also this was a movement um, to reinvestigate the source of moral and spiritual value. A lot of the people in the Renaissance, even though they were Christians, they were humanists. So they emphasized the dignity and value of human beings as opposed to only focusing on the glory of God, for example, and 
of the beauty and wonder of this life, the earthly life, as opposed to the afterlife or heaven. So it was a huge kind of shift in emphasis. One of the famous architectural products of the Renaissance in Italy was the Cathedral of Florence, which you can see in this picture. So it was one of the first large domes created in Europe after antiquity. Um, and they were trying to style it in a way that kind of was hearkening back to ancient Rome, uh, which was uh, the Romans had invented the dome in antiquity. Um, so a lot was going on with the Renaissance. It was considered controversial by some in the church. For example, the um, Italian priest Savonarola reacted against the Florentine Renaissance and did the infamous bonfire of the vanities where a lot of the works of the uh, Renaissance were burned in a bonfire. He thought it was basically irreligious or too worldly. Um, so it was kind of back and forth, but the Renaissance had a big impact on the church. There were even like popes as well as kings and nobles who patronized Renaissance art and literature. During this time in the 14 and 1500s is when the Ottoman Turks were gaining their empire. They eventually completely wiped out the remnants of the Eastern Roman Empire by capturing the capital Constantinople in 1453. And then they started advancing into Southeastern Europe, conquering Greece and other parts of the Balkans, and eventually threatening parts of Central Europe like Vienna itself, which was one of the um, important capitals of the Holy Roman Empire. So during the later part of the Renaissance, that period of time, there was the Protestant Reformation, which you can date from roughly the early 1500s to around 1650. So the Reformation was a movement to reform the Catholic Church, which um, by this time had uh, developed practices that some people regarded as corrupt or illegitimate, such as selling indulgences for the sake of having fewer years of purification in purgatory before going on to heaven. So the Reformation advocated for various reforms on the Roman Catholic Church. It also was influenced by the Renaissance idea of ad fontes, or to the sources. They advocated a return to the original sources of Christianity, like the New Testament and some of the early church fathers, as opposed to the whole accumulated later tradition of a thousand years plus of later church teachings. They critiqued the supremacy of the Pope and the corruption of the clergy. So uh, the first significant uh, reformer was Martin Luther. He was not the first one to have similar ideas, but his critiques of the Catholic Church kind of lit the match that burned all across Europe, so to speak. It actually spread, uh, unlike the ideas of earlier reformers. Um, so he was a Catholic monk who posted 95 theses critical of certain church doctrines um, and he critiqued, among other things, the sale of indulgences. Um, this was the idea that um, souls go to purgatory after death. M unless you're a saint, unless you're completely pure of sin, then before you can get into heaven, even if you're saved, according to the Catholic Church, you have to spend a long amount of time in a kind of uh, pre-heaven state of being called purgatory, which means the place of purification, basically. So you'll have a kind of spiritual uh, fire that you're burned in, but it might be painful, but it's actually good for you. It's burning away all the impurities of your soul. Well, the church also taught that you could have time in purgatory reduced by doing acts of good deeds or merit, like giving money to the church. But what this became sometimes in practice was just paying your way out of having to suffer the consequences of your sin. So that whole idea was criticized by Martin Luther and other reformers. So it appears that initially he may not have intended his reforms to cause him to break with the Catholic Church. Probably he intended just to debate these ideas, and his hope was that his ideas would then become adopted by the church. It would reform itself. Um, but he was considered um, heretical by a lot in the church. He was kind of put on a kind of ecclesiastical uh, trial um, he gained the support of the Elector of Saxony and some other princes of the Holy Roman Empire who themselves had political reasons for wanting more independence from Rome and from the emperor of the empire as a whole. And so that was probably part of the reason why they protected him and backed him. So uh, because he couldn't reconcile with the church, he refused to change his opinion. Um, his protectors in the German nobility were able to save him from 
any kind of uh, punishment or execution or anything like that. Um, he broke from the church, as did his followers, and he eventually ended up establishing his own church. It's called the Lutheran Church today. There were other reformers, though, around the same time. So this was after the invention of the printing press in the late 1400s. That's one of the reasons why the ideas of the reformers are able to spread so far across Western Europe. Um, another reformer was Holdrich Zwingli. Um, he at least initially taught that the church morals and institutions should be reformed, but he didn't initially advocate rejecting church doctrines. But the Reformation kind of took up its own momentum, and gradually the reformers became more and more radical in terms of their proposed changes. Like, for example, in um, the Lutheran church, according to Luther's teachings, there should be no monastics or contemplatives even though he was originally a monk himself. These are people who renounce the world, spend their life in prayer. Um, and also Luther advocated married clergy, that instead of having priests who don't marry, there should be clergy um, that are called ministers in Lutheranism that um, don't have the same sacramental status, like for example, forgiving sins, um, but also are allowed to marry. So there's less of a dichotomy between lay people and clergy in the Reformed churches. Um, John Calvin was a Swiss reformer. He was the second most or just equally influential as Luther, and he created a new church and political system as well to go along with it in the city of Geneva, Switzerland. Um, so the reformers had a lot of different beliefs, like for example, they had different interpretations of the Eucharist, what it meant uh, for it to be a reenactment of the Last Supper. So Luther was a bit unique among the reformers in insisting that no, Jesus was actually present in the bread and wine of the, um, the Eucharist. This is called the real presence. But Calvin argued that the Eucharist is just a, a memorial, a commemoration of the Last Supper. It doesn't literally involve the presence of Jesus in the elements, the bread and wine of the Eucharist. But what they tended to agree on are called the three sole, or the three onlys in Latin. Sola fide, sola scriptura, and sola gratia. Sola fide means soul, uh, by faith alone. So this is a theory of justification or salvation, according to Luther and other reformers, based largely on their interpretations of the letters of the Apostle Paul. They thought that good deeds or works including rituals like the Eucharist, do not provide salvation or justification, but rather faith, this interior state alone. Sola Scriptura is only by the scripture or the Bible. They thought that doctrine should only be based on the Bible, not on church tradition. And sola gratia, or salvation only by grace of God. So it's not something that's earned by human will or humans performing works. Um, so they had those in common. They rejected the supremacy of the Pope. They largely rejected um, a lot of the sacraments. Different Reformed churches had different lists of sacraments. They generally always included baptism and the Eucharist, although they had different interpretations and ways of doing the Eucharist. But a lot of the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church were rejected, like the sacrament of confession, for example, whereby um, people confess their sins to before a priest and the priest basically absolves them. And this is based on a passage in the Bible where Jesus commissions his apostles with having the ability to um, bind and release. So basically tell, uh, it's interpreted by the Catholic and the Orthodox as being able to uh, forgive sins through the sacrament of confession. But anyway, so there were a lot of uh, reforms being proposed and all of these sects of um, Western Christianity that broke off from the Catholic Church, all those are called Protestant Christians. Um, and so it's because they emerged in the Reformation's protest against the Catholic Church. Western Europe was originally completely Catholic. It became divided between Catholic and Protestant kingdoms or areas. There were wars and persecutions. A lot of people died over these religious fights. Um, so eventually there was a Catholic Reformation or a Counter-Reformation where the Catholic Church tried to respond to the Reformation. Depending upon how you count it, this lasted from around 1545 all the way to 1648, which was the end of the Thirty Years' War, which was partly fought over religion in the Holy Roman Empire. One of the main events of the Counter-Reformation or Catholic Reformation was the Council of Trent, which sat between 1545 and 1563, 
where the Catholic clergy got together and decided a lot of their positions. They largely just reaffirmed their previous doctrines and practices, but they did respond, um, clarify the doctrine of indulgences, and try to correct some of the actual abuses of the clergy that have been identified by the reformers. By the way, the picture in the slide is of Martin Luther. So then we have the early modern period, which you could date from around 1600 to 1800. So the beginning of this overlaps with the Reformation period. The first half of the 17th century was marked by the Thirty Years' War from 1618 to 1648. This was a large war fought across the Holy Roman Empire. It was for political reasons, um, but a lot of the war also involved the um, Protestant states of the Holy Roman Empire trying to assert their right to have a non-Catholic religion uh, against the Holy Roman Emperor, but it was also the Catholic Holy Roman Emperor wanting to assert his authority over the other princes to guarantee his role as the monarch in charge of the whole empire. It was also France, which was a Catholic kingdom, but it was not allied with the Holy Roman Emperors, but rather allied with his enemies because they regard the Holy Roman Emperor as one of their main rivals in Europe. So it was this long drawn out affair. Sweden and other countries outside of the Holy Roman Empire, France, etc., took part. Um, and a lot of people died. A lot of the cities of Germany were depopulated because the fighting was so bad, very destructive. But at the end of the Thirty Years' War, there was a treaty that affirmed the principle that whoever was the ruler of their state or kingdom could choose the religion that would be present there. And this was basically either Catholicism, Lutheran Christianity, or Calvinist Christianity. The, the Calvinist churches were the various ones based on the teachings of John Calvin uh, of Switzerland. So you can see on the map um, how this largely shook out. Um, one thing to note is that there was also the Church of, Anglican, of England or the Anglican Church. This started in the early 1500s when King Henry VIII broke away from the Catholic Church, largely because he wanted to secure an annulment of his first marriage to uh, Catherine of Aragon so he could remarry Anne Boleyn because he was not producing an heir with his first wife and he was still very set on having a male heir who could inherit his kingdom. So that was one of the main instigators for him to establish a new church. But the Church of England rapidly evolved away from Catholicism because there were some Protestant reformers who became influential. But it was kind of like a halfway house between Catholicism and the more radical reforms of other um, Protestant churches like the Lutherans and the Calvinists. Um, so all of that was happening. The Catholics did succeed in reconverting some parts of Protestant Europe to Catholicism. This was part of the Counter-Reformation. There was also a missionary aspect to it. For example, Hungary and Bohemia uh, and other parts of Eastern and Central Europe were kind of made mostly Catholic again. Um, there were attacks on Protestant communities in France. The Huguenots um, were French Calvinists. But um, nevertheless, at the end of the day, Protestant churches did remain. They were not completely reconquered or reintegrated within Catholic Christendom. And so Western Christianity was split between Catholicism and a kind of proliferation of Protestant churches. The 1600s are also known as the Age of Reason because this is the birth of modern science, which has experiment and um, mathematical models and careful observations. So it differed from the older forms of natural philosophy or the old science. Um, it's also the beginnings of early modern philosophy, people like Rene Descartes, uh, who was a Frenchman. And these people, they were making a break with the medieval philosophical tradition that had been taught by the Christian schools and that was focused largely on theology, like Thomas Aquinas, Duns Scotus, and others. So this is why it's significant in terms of the religion, because the new science and even the new era of philosophy is less based on the church tradition. In the 1700s, there was a movement known as the Enlightenment, and it was a very um, multifaceted uh, cultural movement, mainly among the educated elites, but it advocated using reason, the new science, in, as opposed to tradition or religious revelation to discover the truth. They also had political ideals such as 
the liberty of the natural liberty of all humans, the natural equality of all humans. Government should have less of a monarchic or aristocratic structure. And if there is a monarch, um, the monarch's power should be limited by a constitution. There should be other organs of the government, such as parliaments or other representative bodies, where the people, apart from the king and nobles or aristocrats, have some input into the governance of the nation. Um, they had various political ideas, and they didn't all agree. It was like a widespread movement. There was a lot of diversity in it, but they tended to reject church authority, reject church tradition, and also reject the authority of kings and aristocrats. Um, they also had an artistic and aesthetic side. They mainly advocated a revival of ancient Greek and Roman forms, but in a perceived purified way. So in that way, they were kind of like a latter-day semi-revival of the Renaissance, but an important difference is that the Enlightenment was actually a bit more based on certain um, ancient Greek aesthetics, although they did use ancient Roman aesthetics as well. So kind of like the culmination of the Enlightenment was in the French Revolution. Uh, we could also mention the American Revolution of 1776 in this regard because they were motivated by the political ideas of the um, Enlightenment. But the French Revolution was even more momentous for Christianity because there was a large anti-church or anti-clerical component. So this was largely led by people in Paris who wanted to overthrow the monarchy and the aristocracy, or initially, actually, they just wanted to end the absolute monarchy of the French kings and create um, a representative body that would complement the king, but the more radical revolutionaries were able to win out in the debates of their um, assembly that they had gathered, and they seized power, they beheaded the king and queen of France, they started to um, murder a lot of the aristocracy, this is called the terror, um, and they also attacked the Catholic Church, they advocated for a secular government, um, there was like spirit, uh, periodic or sporadic persecutions of priests and others. So it's a very violent, very unstable time. And basically it marks the beginning of the decline of the influence of the Catholic Church, even on Catholic nations. And the ideal of secularism, which eventually spread to other countries in Europe too, so that the Protestant churches also started to decline in significance in their respective countries. So later 19th century revolutionaries, such as in 1848, were often anti-clerical or anti-church as well. In the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, you know, the majority of people through a lot of this time in Europe and other places um, that were Western in culture like the United States were still a majority Christian, but Christianity started to gradually recede and it started with the educated elites, kind of like the heirs of the enlightenment, but a lot of the anti-church and anti-religion uh, ideology just kind of increased in the 1800s. So for example, Ludwig Feuerbach, who's shown in the picture, he was a German atheist philosopher who argued that the idea of God was an invention of the human mind. Karl Marx was a German Jewish philosopher and economist who argued that God was invented by the ruling class to help them control the working class by giving them a false hope of an afterlife where they would get a reward even though they were oppressed and exploited in this life. Friedrich Nietzsche was a German philologist or student of language who critiqued Christianity as a so-called slave morality. So he thought that it was a morality only fit for people of lower capabilities or people who were not fit to rule themselves but fit to be ruled because Christianity, for example, um, praises the poor and the meek and the humble and so on. Nietzsche admired the ancient pagan Greeks in their praise for powerful and elite warriors or the greatness of the poets, for example. And he thought that Christianity had too much equality in it, too much attempt to uplifting people who were downtrodden. And he also declared that God is dead. He regarded this in part as a threat to uh, Western or maybe even human civilization because he realized that without God, there was no kind of system of morality or source of goodness. But he thought that the will to power was what would actually replace this. He thought it was true that everything that exists has a kind of will to power, a will to assert itself in the world. But he also thought this would be a replacement in terms of the good, of meaning, of purpose, and of um, virtue or excellence 
away from Christianity. Sigmund Freud was a, a German Jewish psychologist. Uh, now he actually lived in, in Austria, but um, he spoke German. So Austria was basically a um, not part of Germany politically at this time, but uh, Germany uh, German was the main language of their um, literate classes. Uh, so anyway, he wrote in German, and he argued that religion is an illusion for wish fulfillment. So these were all various uh, secular critiques uh, of Christianity and kind of like religion in general, but they were very influential among the more educated classes who started to um, turn away from Christianity. And you see this process intensify in the 20th century when Karl Marx's uh, communist political ideology started to have political success. So the first major success was in the Russian Revolution of 1917, whose uh, leaders were all communists, and they established the Soviet Union, or the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR. And communism was an atheist ideology. So wherever communist regimes were established, they tended to attack Christianity and the church, sometimes ban it. They weren't able to totally destroy it, but they definitely tried to encourage people not to be religious, and they would often persecute uh, both clergy and also uh, people who were believers in various ways. And after World War II, with the defeat of Adolf Hitler, the Soviet Union was able to occupy with its armies much of Eastern Europe and set up communist regimes there, which were kind of like their client states, and they also persecuted the church. So Catholicism and Orthodoxy in Eastern and Central Europe uh, were very seriously oppressed by communists in the 20th century. The Soviet Union began to collapse economically and politically, and it started to end in 1989. Um, and the regimes that replaced it, uh, communism also collapsed throughout the Eastern Europe, and the regimes that replaced it were less anti-religious. Some of them were even uh, pro-religious. So Orthodoxy and Catholicism started a bit of a revival in some parts of, of Eastern and Central Europe, but there had been so many decades of just declining religiosity generally and attacks by the church uh, of the church by the communist regimes that it didn't fully bounce back. Um, so yeah, this is kind of like a, just a brief summary of some of the reasons why Christianity went into decline in Europe and the West. There is more going on though as well. There's kind of a general thing with modern society that um, as societies tend to develop economically, they tend to become more secular. That was observed, for example, also in various countries in East Asia, including ones that weren't communist like South Korea and Japan. So that secularization process may have had something to do with the decline of Christianity in Europe as well. So in addition um, to talking about the, the Renaissance and the Reformation and kind of like the modern era, it's important to talk about how Christianity spread outside of the West. Now Christianity did start in the Middle East and there were ancient churches outside of Europe from the beginning, like Ethiopia was the second kingdom to convert to Christianity, so this is in East Africa. There were ancient churches founded in India, according to their tradition by um, St. Thomas the Apostle, um, and in other parts of the Middle East, and there are even churches that went as far as China along the Silk Road, although they eventually died out. Um, so starting in the age of discovery though europeans such as christopher columbus sought to bring christianity to other parts of the world the europeans starting the portuguese and the spanish and the dutch and then other european countries were sailing all around the world um, they mainly wanted to open up trade routes with india and china and other parts of um, east and southeast asia that had uh, things like spices and silks and things uh, like um, cotton and sugar, they just couldn't get easily in Europe. So it was very profitable to trade with them. But especially the Catholic nations of Portugal and Spain, they would send missionaries, uh, priests, clergy with their trading missions to try to spread Catholicism. And also Spain and Portugal ended up conquering uh, large parts of the Americas, the, the New World, and spread Catholicism there as well. The Portuguese and Spanish were rivals in terms of their um, overseas empires, but they were both Catholic. So that's the religion that they spread when they were traveling throughout the world. Um, an important element in the spread of Catholicism was the Jesuits or Society of Jesus. This was a religious order so of Catholic clergy that had been founded by Ignatius Loyola in 1540. And they were some of the main Catholic missionaries during this time. So at this period of time, Protestants were not that active in missionary work. 
Protestantism was mainly being spread throughout the world, the world through European settlers, like um, Dutch people uh, settling in South Africa, bringing the Dutch Reformed Church, a type of Calvinism, or um, English and other British settlers in North America. So bringing um, the Church of England, bringing various types of uh, nonconformists or dissenters, people who were in England but didn't want to be Anglican. So these can include Congregationalists, uh, Quakers, Methodists, uh, Baptists, and others. Uh, Scotland was Presbyterian by this time. They had their own church, not Church of England. And this was a Calvinist church, but there were Presbyterians migrating to the uh, British colonies in North America as well. There were German um, settlers who settled uh, largely in North America. Some of them were Anabaptists. These became the Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, and so during this time, there was a lot of spread of Christianity. The Catholics were most active in missionary work. The Protestants were most active in just um, spreading settlers. But Catholicism spread a lot more widely. Um, okay, so... Protestant missionary activity actually started to take off in the very late 18th century. And this was part of the first, um, or sorry, the uh, second Great Awakening, where it was kind of like an evangelical revival, people trying to um, have a personal relationship, a personal encounter with Jesus, but also their desire was to spread the gospel through uh, evangelical work. E evangelical means related to the gospel. It's from the Greek word uh, eo angelion, or the good news. So some of these English um, missionary societies were the Baptist Missionary Society, founded in 1792, the London Missionary Society, 1795, the Church Missionary Society, 1799. And nowadays, we actually mainly associate Christian missionary activity with Protestants, but this didn't really become a thing until the very end of the 1700s, and then it started to pick up steam more in the 1800s, and that's also when the Catholic missionary activity started to decline. Um, so yeah, these Protestant missions helped spread British forms of Protestant Christianity to Africa, India, and Oceania. Um, and then there were American missionary societies, too. This is mainly in the 1800s and 1900s that helped spread Protestant Christianity to places like Korea and China. Um, and then there were later waves of Christian migrants to North America, too, that were spreading other forms of Christianity there. Like, for example, in the 1800s, there were large numbers of Lutherans from Germany and Scandinavia that brought Lutheran Christianity to the United States and Canada. And there were also large waves of Catholics from Germany, Ireland, and Italy in the 1800s. In terms of recent developments in the 20th century and also continuing in the 21st, there's been a massive decline of Christianity in the West. Um, a lot of people are not even nominally Christian, whether Catholic or Protestant. Among those who are, who claim to be uh, Catholic or Protestant, church attendance is down and other forms of religious participation is way down. Um, Christianity has grown a lot in non-Western nations, uh, such as in Africa and in parts of Latin America and Asia. The most rapidly growing forms of Christianity are evangelical and Pentecostal. For example, um, Latin America, including nations like Mexico, the various nations of Central America and South America, um, these were originally completely Catholic. But now there's a lot of evangelicals and Pentecostals as well as Catholic Christians there. Um, and then Christianity continues to thrive and spread in developing nations in sub-Saharan Africa. Like the picture in the slide is of a Nigerian megachurch. So some of the largest uh, church congregations in the world are in Nigeria. Pentecostal Christianity is an evangelical, are both types of Protestant Christianity. We'll talk about them a bit later on. So now we're going to go through the various branches of the church, some of their main distinctive teachings and practices. Let's start with the map of the growth of Christianity in the Roman Empire. The main thing to note here is the areas where Christianity started, the, the dark red areas, concentrated Christian congregations by 325 CE or AD. So these include places like Rome, a lot of the major cities like Antioch, Jerusalem, Alexandria, Constantinople in the east. Um, and then Christianity gradually spreads out to more of the countryside further from the coast. 
Another thing to note is the areas that have uh, diagonal lines on them or hatching. These are areas of different types of Christianity. So the areas with the blue hatching are mainly Arian Christians. The Arians are followers of Arius or Arius, who denied the doctrine of the Trinity. He denied that Jesus's divinity was equal to that of the Father. He regarded Jesus as a created being, not as co-equal or co-eternal with the Father. And that was actually very prominent in a lot of the Western parts of the Roman Empire, particularly in the successor states after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. A lot of the Germanic invaders were Germanic tribes that had been converted to Aryan Christianity. The main exception being the Franks, a Germanic tribe from Western Europe that was Catholic. But most of the Germanic successor kingdoms were Aryan. In the east, you can see areas of green hatching. That's so-called Nestorian churches or the Church of the East. Um, and they reject some uh, the Council of Ephesus, actually. Um, so the largely these different types of Christians were determined by which of the early church councils they rejected. Arians rejected Nicaea, for example. Um, and then the areas of the purple hatching in the east, those are supporting monophysitism. So they reject the Council of Chalcedon. They have a different way of formulating their view of the nature of Jesus. Um, that's sometimes called monophysitism or meophysitism. Um, the idea that of the Council of Chalcedon is that Jesus is one person but with two natures, one human, one divine. Um, depending on your interpretation, there actually may not be a lot of difference between the Christology or Theory of Christ support, supported by the Monophysite churches. In fact, there was an agreement signed by some of them in the Catholic Church not that long ago affirming they actually had the same Christology, just different way of expressing it. But nevertheless, um, because they rejected the Council of Chalcedon, that led to splits within the early Christian church. So th here's a list of some of the important early councils and the schisms or splits in the church that resulted from them. The Council of Nicaea, among other things, affirmed the doctrine of the Trinity. And as mentioned on the previous slide, the Arian Christians rejected the Nicene Creed and its formulation of the Trinity. The Council of Ephesus was in 431. Um, there are actually a couple of councils of Nicaea, by the way, but one of them was in 325. The Council of Ephesus was in 431. And this was the council that was not accepted by the Church of the East, which uh, Western Christians called Nestorians after the teaching of the priest Nestorius, although apparently he didn't actually affirm the um, views that were kind of attributed to the Church of the East. So it's a bit of a misnomer. But anyway, they reject the Council of Ephesus, and that's when they split off from the rest of Christianity. The Council of Chalcedon was in 451, and this was when the Oriental Orthodox, or the so-called Monophysite or Miaphysite churches, rejected um, the Council of Chalcedon's way of articulating their Christology, or their theory of the dual nature of Christ as both human and divine. Um, the Great Schism happened many centuries later in 1054, um, this was the division between the Catholic and Orthodox churches that we previously identified, um, and that was based, among other things, on disputes over the supremacy of the Pope or the Bishop of Rome, and on things like the Filioque Clause of the Nicene Creed used in the Western churches. Um, a lot of the divisions, though, the churches we're going to look at are also from the Reformation and after. So 1517 is when Martin Luther posts his 95 Theses for debate. Um, and then in the ensuing decades and next century or so, there's a lot of different uh, Reformed or Protestant churches being formed. And that's still happening today. There's still new forms of Protestantism that are constantly emerging. The picture on the slide, by the way, is the map of the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, showing the Catholic and the Arian kingdoms in 495 AD. So this was 
shortly after the end of the Western Roman Empire. You can see the Eastern Roman Empire is all green, so it is still Catholic or affirms the Orthodox theology um, of Nicaea. Now, if you go to Western Europe or North Africa at the time, this is before the Muslim conquest, so North Africa was still largely quit, uh, Christian, they, most of the people would have actually been Catholic. But um, the rulers of the successor states of the Western Roman Empire, the various uh, Germanic tribes that had conquered them, they were Aryan Christian. So that's why it says Aryan rule as opposed to like all the people uh, of those kingdoms were, were Aryan. Most of them were actually still Catholic. So before we begin the um, enumeration of the main types of Christianity, it's important to get a sense of um, what a lot of the churches have in common. Before the Protestant Reformation in 1517, all of the various churches had a lot of beliefs and practices in common, and they still keep these in common today. These pre-Reformation churches, so these are ones whose history goes back before 1517, include the Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Churches, Oriental Orthodox Churches, and the Church of the East. So they don't only use the Bible or scripture as a source of teachings, they also use church tradition and certain church authority, like the Pope, for example, or church councils. Um, they use seven sacraments, so seven holy rituals that are regarded of primary importance and that are involved in the maintenance of the church, but also salvation. These include baptism, which is the ritual of Christian initiation, confirmation, um, this is done when a person comes of age. So these churches practice infant baptism. So when a person is born, they can be baptized as a member of the church. But then there's a follow-up ritual done um, in youth where the person reaffirms their commitment to the church when they, they're able to understand rationally what they're agreeing to. Um, confession of sins uh, to a priest who will then prescribe um, a way of having... A, prescribe a penance so the person can basically have their sins forgiven. Um, communion or the Eucharist, this is probably the most important of the sacraments in terms of salvation. So this is eating the bread, drinking the wine that's regarded as the body and blood of Jesus. Um, supreme unction or um, anointing of a sick, as it's called in Catholicism nowadays. So this is done when a person is ill, they're anointed with oil for healing, and it can also be done before death. Um, holy matrimony and holy orders. So holy matrimony is um, sacrament for wedded couples. It's regarded as a type of vocation or calling, um, but different from that of the clergy. And then holy orders is ordination of priests. Um, so they have all these sacraments in common. They have similar sources of teachings. They also have a similar ecclesiology or a theory of the structure and governance of the church. So there's basically four types of ordained clergy, deacons, priests, bishops, and patriarchs. So deacons, um, they don't have the same authority. They can't like lead a mass, unlike priests, bishops, or patriarch. Priests uh, are the ones who have the authority to um, give con confession to uh, give communion um, and perform a lot of the other rituals of the uh, church. Um, bishops are actually the original kind of like clergy. Um, if you go back to the New Testament, it mentions deacons and bishops. Um, and the bishops are what we would normally think of as priests, but they had authority over the church in a particular city. And the reason why the priests or presbyters evolve as a separate type of clergy is basically because when there's enough Christians in the city, the populations get big enough, the bishops have to appoint presbyters or preachers to help them run more local churches so everyone can have a place to go to church for the Day of the Lord or Sunday, which is uh, when Christians usually um, gather um, for their worship. Um, and then patriarchs is basically bishops, but ones that have a special prestige or authority. So they're usually the head of their church. So for example, um, in the Catholic church, the supreme patriarch is the Bishop of Rome or the Pope. 
Um, other practices they have is veneration of saints, angels, and the Virgin Mary. So technically, uh, Christians only worship God in the three persons of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But they can um, pray for the intercession of other saved beings, saints, angels, the Virgin Mary. So the idea is you're asking these beings to pray on your behalf to God and on the thinking that they are closer to God, they reflect his glory, and so they can basically help you. So the way that is often explained by people who do these practices is it's similar to asking someone else to pray for you, but you're asking for people that are, have been sanctified to pray for you, and so it's regarded as having maybe greater spiritual power or significance. So that's connected to the intercessory prayer. That's basically the underlying justification for the veneration of the saints um, and the Virgin Mary. Um, and the use of icons. There was an iconoclasm controversy early on in the history of the church, but basically um, all of these pre-Reformation churches came to accept that images of Jesus and God the Father and of the patriarchs and prophets and all these things can be a part of worship. Um, uh, they can be used basically to assist the imagination uh, in prayer, for example. And then also venerating relics of um, saints, um, like their mortal remains or things that they touched. All of this is a, as a part of all of these churches. So in the picture is a priest in the Ethiopian, the Ethiopian Orthodox um, Church. This is one of the most ancient churches actually in Christianity. So um, there's an Ethiopian convert, for example, mentioned in the uh, New Testament. And according to historians, Ethiopia was the second ancient kingdom to convert to Christianity after Armenia. But it's just an example of the diversity of all these pre-Reformation churches, even though they had a lot of beliefs and practices in common. The uh, Eastern churches include the uh, three main types, the Church of the East, the Oriental Orthodox Churches and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. The Church of the East is the one nicknamed Nestorianism by Western Christians, but they're not actually followers of Nestorius, who was an ancient uh, Egyptian priest. But they formed in the Persian or Sassanid Empire in 410 AD. They reject the Council of Ephesus. They weren't a part of that. There are a few around today, but they are much smaller numbers than um, Orthodox and Catholic churches. The Oriental Orthodox churches include the ancient churches of Syria, Egypt, Ethiopia, etc. They were not part of the Council of Chalcedon, and so they have a different way of expressing their Christology. That's called monophysite in the West. They usually call it miaphysite, one nature. So they think of Christ as both human and divine, but those two things, the human and the divine, are combined in one nature, um, as opposed to having two natures, each human, each divine one human, one divine. Uh, and then the Eastern Orthodox churches are the ones that only split later from the Catholic Church in the West. So they accept all the same councils up to a point, Nicaea, Ephesus, and Chalcedon. They reject the supremacy of the Pope. They don't think of the bishops of Rome as the true successors of St. Peter, um, and thus as the vicars of Christ on earth. They have several patriarchates, including Constantinople, Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem, but none of those patriarchs has supremacy. Um, practically speaking, the Eastern Orthodox churches have broken up nowadays into different churches, largely along national lines. So, for example, the Russian Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, um, they uh, don't really have a common um, governance. Uh, they have similar practices and beliefs. But it's actually also difficult for modern Eastern Orthodox churches to form councils that are binding on all the members. Um, that hasn't been done in a long time. They also reject the uh, Catholic Church's use of the filioque clause and from the Son in the Nicene Creed. They only regard the Holy Spirit as proceeding from the Father, God the Father, not God the Son. There's around 322 million Eastern Orthodox Christians in the world as a whole. Uh, from the picture is just an ordination ceremony from an Eastern Orthodox Church for a subdeacon. The Roman Catholic Church is the largest uh, single Christian church at 1.2 billion members. One of their uh, teachings is papal supremacy. The Pope, the Bishop of Rome, has supreme authority over the church as a whole. They regard him as the successor of St. Peter 
and thus Christ's vicar or representative on earth. They also have a doctrine of papal infallibility. So it's not that everything the Pope says is infallible or can't be wrong, but when speaking with full authority or ex cathedra on faith and morals, the Pope's word is regarded as infallible. Um, one of the other distinctive Catholic teachings are the Marian dogmas, or these are beliefs about um, the Virgin Mary, Mother of God. So divine motherhood, perpetual virginity, immaculate conception. That refers to the idea that uh, Mary herself was conceived without sin and assumption that after, uh, instead of dying and having her body placed into the earth, um, she was bodily assumed into heaven at the moment of her death. Traditionally, the Roman Catholic Church used a Latin liturgy, although since the Second Vatican Council, that's largely changed. They usually use vernacular or locally spoken languages. The Council of Trent, uh, which was in response to the Protestant Reformation, was also very important in the formation of the modern Roman Catholic Church. They clarified uh, a lot of their doctrines and updated their liturgy. Um, some of that was in response to the critiques of the Protestant reformers. A lot of the traditions of the Catholic Church were changed after the Second Vatican Council, which met from 1962 to 1965. There were a lot of objectives uh, and resolutions of the Second Vatican Council, but one of the objectives was just to try to modernize the church, to bring it more into contact with the spirit of the age, you might say. So this ended up um, in resulting in a highly simplified liturgy um, use of vernacular languages like English or Spanish, for example, rather than Latin, decreasing the fasting and other obligations of Catholics. So um, that's been a significant change. And then another interesting thing in the 19th, or sorry, the 20th century was the movement of liberation theology. This has gone into decline, but in the mid to um, beginning of the latter half of the 20th century, a lot of uh, Roman Catholic clergy of a more liberal or progressive bent politically were influenced by Marxism, and they wanted to kind of combine the Marxist idea of liberating working classes from capitalist exploitation, unite that with uh, Christian theology. Um, there are certainly big differences between Marxism and Christianity, but they are probably trying to draw on the idea of um, Jesus's teaching of the poor having kind of special place in the kingdom the wealthy of being, you know, especially hard to get into the kingdom. Jesus is always trying to lift up those who were oppressed and downtrodden. Liberation of theology, though, is not as influential in the church as a whole as it once was, but there are still a lot of um, liberal and progressive strains of thought in the church, as well as more conservative and reactionary um, strains of thought, too. More recently, in the last couple of decades, there have been a series of sexual abuse uh, scandals in the Catholic church. Um, so this was... Going back at least to the mid uh, 20th century, there were clergy who were sexually abusing uh, children and other people and who were basically protected by the church. They are moved around. So this led to a lot of um, negative publicity. Some Catholics lost their faith. Um, and there's still often a sense of a kind of like not fully resolved some of the problems in the church that led to this. And there have been similar, um, some sex abuse scandals in other churches too after this um, instance. In the picture is the current Pope of the Catholic Church, uh, Pope Francis I. Um, there are various churches of the Protestant Reformation. They all stem from the Reformation against the Catholic Church that began in the early 1500s. Um, new churches in the Protestant tradition continue to be formed up to the present day, but we're going to divide these into a few main branches and movements. The Lutheran, the Reformed, the Anglican, the Free Churches, the Evangelical, and Charismatics or Pentecostals. The picture on the slide is of John Calvin, one of the earlier uh, Protestant reformers. So Lutheran churches are those descended from the teachings of Martin Luther, the one who kicked off the Reformation. So one of their distinctive teachings is justification by faith alone. Unlike a lot of the other reformers, Luther taught the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. A lot of his ideas and those of similarly minded reformers like Philip Melanchthon, were included in the Augsburg Confession, authored in 1530. This was basically a set of principles that were affirmed by various princes in Germany who were supporting Luther's reforms. Um, they have a relatively more conservative or traditional liturgy than the other 
Reformed churches. In other words, they retained more of the Catholic rituals. It's still very different from a, a Catholic uh, liturgy or, or church rituals performed on Sunday, the day of the Lord. But um, the basic guiding principle, at least a, a way of understanding it simply, the Lutherans retained a lot of the Catholic traditions unless they thought there was a good reason to get rid of them. Whereas some of the other reformers like John Calvin tried to rebuild Christianity more from the ground up. And so they would only accept a Catholic ritual or tradition they thought it was biblically based or otherwise justified. Um, but the Lutheran churches are a lot different from the Catholic churches. They don't use icons or images of any type. Their clergy are non-celibate and non-sacramental. They do preside over the Eucharist, but they don't have the same ability to forgive sin, for example. They don't have any contemplatives, so no monks or nuns. Uh, the government of the Lutheran churches varies. Some do have bishops or episcopal governance. Others only have priests, Presbyterian governance, and there are some that are governed by the congregation. Um, the total number of Lutherans worldwide is 75 million. It started in Germany, so it's still somewhat prominent there and in Scandinavia, uh, and also in North America and throughout the world. The Reformed churches are those based on the teachings of John Calvin. Um, they were initially prominent in France, Switzerland, the Netherlands, and Scotland, and have since spread around the world. Um, the English Puritans, for example, these were people who wanted to radically uh, reform the Church of England to make it less Catholic and more what they thought of as pure, more Calvinist. They were in the Calvinist tradition. Like Luther, Calvin accepted the three sole, but he did not believe in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist and had other disagreements too, such as with church governance. He abandoned more Catholic practices than the Lutherans. So the ecclesiology does vary between different Reformed churches. It's either Presbyterian or Congregational. So the Presbyterian churches are those that have ordained presbyters or ministers and lay elders that participate in the collective governance of a church by meeting in regional synods or councils. The congregational governance is where each local church, each congregation governs itself. Um, the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, of course, has the Presbyterian system of governance. The congregational uh, churches of England, including those that were brought to the English colonies in North America, you know, the so-called pilgrims and other Puritans, those were congregationalists. The Anglican Church, or the Church of England, originated when King Henry VIII broke off from the Roman Catholic Church, um, in part for political or personal reasons, you might say. So he wanted to annul or undo his marriage with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, and take a new wife, Anne Boleyn, um, because he was having difficulty producing an heir who would survive to adulthood to inherit his kingdom. At first, he was a staunch Catholic and sharp critic of Luther and other reformers, but he broke with the Catholic Church out of his desire for a new wife and also under the influence of some other English reformers that were at and around his court. Um, so the teachings of the Anglican Church, it's a Protestant church, but it does retain some features of the Catholic Church, like a traditional liturgy and a threefold ministry of bishop, bishops, priests, and deacons. And they have a archbishop, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who's the head, uh, well, not the, the, the head of the Church of England is actually the monarch of England, but the clerical head of the church, the Archbishop of Canterbury, has a similar relation to the other bishops as the Bishop of Rome does over Catholics. There are many churches around the world today in communion with the Church of England. These were largely um, outgrowths of the Church of England spread either with colonies of England or with settlers from England going to other parts of the world. Like, for example, in the United States, the Anglican Church became known as the Episcopal Church after the political break with England, but it still is in communion with the Church of England. So there are different wings as well of the Anglican Church. In general, the modern Anglican Church is very liberal or progressive, both politically and in terms of its liturgy and a lot of its other beliefs and practices. For example, they ordain women as priests um, and will bless um, 
LGBT uh, weddings, at least in some um, churches in the Anglican Communion. This has actually led to some schisms. There are some churches that have left communion with the Church of England but are still considered Anglican. It gets kind of complicated. But there's also is and always has been diversity within the Church of England because it started as kind of like a compromise between Catholicism and the more radical reforms. So going back to the 1500s, there were always Anglicans who were a bit more Catholic in their belief and practice. These are called Anglo-Catholics. There's liberal, a wing of the, um, the church, and there's an evangelical wing um, that was influenced by later evangelical movements in the 17 and 1800s. And that's still true to this day. Uh, pictured is the current Archbishop of Canterbury, by the way. So worldwide, um, people in the Church of England and others in communion with it, number 85 million. And then there are the free churches. These originated among the even more radical reformers of the Protestant Reformation who advocated a separation of church and state. The Calvinists, the Lutherans, the other reformers like in the Church of England, they did not think of the church as something that should be separate from the government. They thought the two should go together. The only question was which church the government should support or be allied with. But there were churches who rejected political authority, at least authority over religion. So some of those were the Baptists and the Anabaptists. These rejected infant baptism. They thought that baptism was a sign of adult profession of the faith, and so they only believe in adult baptism. The liturgy in Baptist churches tends to be less structured with the focus on the sermon of a preacher or pastor. Like they don't always have the Eucharist ceremony, for example. One of the main Baptist churches is the Southern Baptist Convention in the United States. Worldwide, the total number of people in the various Baptist churches is around 100 million. Another example of a free church is the Society of Friends, nicknamed the Quakers. Um, they were founded by George Fox, an English uh, Protestant in the 1600s. They radically reject all liturgical forms, including all the sacraments. They reject the clergy, they reject credos or definitions of the faith. Rather, members meet in um, their meeting rooms or meeting houses for silent worship and to attend to their inner light. So they believe each person can basically access the Holy Spirit by looking within. They're also pacifist, anti-war. Nowadays, a lot of Quakers support various social justice causes. They number 400,000 worldwide. The evangelical movement uh, has existed in several phases. It actually goes back to the 1700s with the first great awakening, also called the evangelical revival. It started in England by the preaching of John Wesley. So this was a Protestant movement that emphasized, <coughs> excuse me, in the 1730s and 40s, that emphasized individual devotion and piety. Preaching of the gospel, so spreading the good news, hence evangelical, and a personal encounter with Jesus. It de-emphasized the denominational divides among the Protestants, like, for example, Anglican versus Lutheran, Anglican versus Calvinist, etc. So the Methodist uh, churches all stem from the preaching of John Wesley, who also kicked off the First Great Awakening. So he was a minister of the Church of England, but who advocated a radically different approach to the religion. So one of their innovations in terms of the liturgy was having hymns sung by the whole congregation uh, rather than just by the choir, uh, various types of social action, and trying to bring the gospel into people's lives, trying to have people experience, have a personal encounter with Jesus that they would often express through outpourings of devotion and piety, which was called enthusiasm in the negative sense by um, British Christians who didn't like it in the 1700s. Nowadays, uh, worldwide, the members of the various Methodist churches number around 75 million. This, there was a second Great Awakening in the late 17 and early 1800s, um, also called the Holiness Movement. And this affirms the so-called second work of grace, that after someone is saved, after they find Jesus, they will have this process of entire sanctification or Christian perfection so that the Christian life should be entirely free of sin. Um, 
the Salvation Army is an example of a kind of third wave of evangelical it doesn't have like a name like third great awakening but if you go to later in the 1800s this is where what we think of today as the modern evangelical movement kind of has its start but it's growing out of this earlier history of the first and second great awakening so modern evangelicals will have a lot of the same ideas as wesley and of the second great awakening but they add new practices um, and sort of like ways of expressing their beliefs um, to those earlier traditions. The Salvation Army um, kind of grew out of that period. It was founded by William Booth as a mission to the poor of London. Um, and they preached the gospel along with social action. Their worship style is very informal and Bible-centered with no sacraments. That's one of the features that's similar to some modern evangelicals. Salvation Army has 1.1 million followers worldwide. So the evangelical churches or movement today emphasizes the experience of being born again, turning towards Jesus, and evangelizing or preaching the gospel. They, they usually de-emphasize denominational differences. They may not even um, describe themselves as evangelical. They may just use the word Christian. Sometimes they use the phrase Christianity without adjectives. Um, sometimes they or others will call them non-denominational evangelical. But they're definitely within the, the larger Protestant tradition. So they reject most of the beliefs and practices and traditions of Catholicism and of all the Orthodox churches. They usually have a congregational church governance. But there's many, many of them worldwide. So total numbers around 619 million, although that does include the more evangelical identifying members of some of the other mainline Protestant denominations. Like nowadays, for example, there are evangelical Lutherans, uh, for instance. The picture in the slide is of a large evangelical congregation in the Philippines called Christ's Commission Fellowship. But it gives you a, a glimpse of sort of the modern method of worship that you see in some evangelical megachurches that look kind of like stadiums or theaters, um, but they're churches. Charismatic Christianity is a name for um, kind of like a broad movement and some churches that grew out of it that started in the early 20th century. So the early forms of this are called the Pentecostal churches or the Pentecostal movement. And they emphasize baptism in the Holy Spirit and getting gifts of the Holy Spirit or charismata, including ecstatic experiences, healing, laying on of hands, and speaking in tongues. The start of this was the Azusa Street Revival, which was a small kind of pop-up church led by the um, black, the African-American pastor, William J. Seymour in Los Angeles, California from 1906 to 1915. So he started meeting and preaching and people were speaking in tongues they are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, and there were a mix uh, of whites and American blacks as well. So that was one of the interesting things about the Pentecostal movement. It was one of the first Christian churches or movements in the U.S. that brought people of different races together in the same congregations. So the first um, Pentecostal church to be founded was the Assemblies of God, which was founded in 1911. But by now, there's a lot of other Pentecostal churches, and it's a kind of broader movement that seeped into other churches and denominations. It's quite strong and glowing, growing in Latin America and Africa. So the total worldwide adherence to Pentecostalism is around 130 million. Um, the charismatic movement is a late 20th century thing, but it's a movement within already established Catholic and so-called mainline Protestant churches. Those are basically the older, more organized forms of Protestantism, like the Lutherans, the Anglicans, and the various types of Calvinists, Presbyterians, Congregationalists, and so on. Those who adopted elements of charismatic Christianity, those are the ones who are part of this charismatic movement. It started in the Anglican Church in 1960, but in the ensuing decade spread to Lutherans, Presbyterians, Catholics, and Methodists. So it's not the whole of these churches that are charismatic, but certain subsections of them. Like for example, there are some charismatic Catholics. 
And finally, there's the ecumenical movement. This is a 20th century movement for cooperation between different Christian churches. Its main embodiment is the organization, the World Council of Churches, formed in 1948. It meets periodically every seven years to enable debate and dialogue between different churches. Um, practically speaking, this isn't a very cohesive entity. Um, the churches have a lot of disagreements, but it is um, embodying this kind of idea that was probably even more prominent in the 20th century of trying to create dialogue, discussion, and possibility for future consensus among various Christian churches. Chapter 38, Sacred Writings. So the Christian scriptures are called the Bible. It's a collection of many books with two main sections. The Old Testament is shared with the Jews. So the contents are basically same as that of the Tanakh or Hebrew Bible. And the second part is the New Testament, which is unique to Christians. Kind of a complicating factor with the Old Testament is that different Christian churches have different versions of the Old Testament. The Catholic and Orthodox churches have versions based on the Septuagint or the ancient Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures. The Protestant um, version of the Old Testament, it has mostly the same books and texts, but they exclude some texts that are not part of the modern rabbinic Jewish Tanakh. Um, and they also, uh, historically, the uh, earliest versions of the Protestant Bible were translations from the Hebrew, as opposed to earlier versions of the Catholic and Orthodox Bibles that were translations from the Greek Septuagint. So the Old Testament is largely written originally in Hebrew, some Aramaic. It's uh, shared with Judaism. So you can divide the books of the Old Testament into several main bunches or parts. There's the Pentateuch or the five books. Those are attributed traditionally to Moses, who had them revealed to him by God on Mount Sinai. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There's the historical books. Those include uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth. 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Those tell the story of the history of the ancient kingdom of Israel. The poetical and wisdom books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. They're different genres. So, for example, Psalms is a book of songs, most of which are hymns. Job is the story of a righteous servant of God who's tested by Satan to see if his faith will persevere, etc. The prophetic books, these are the prophets. Um, they give a lot of um, teachings about the future, including the reestablishment of the kingdom of Israel, the coming of the Messiah, but also commentary of their own times. They'll often call out kings for being not faithful to God and calling the Jews to repent, things like that. They include Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many others. And then there are the Apocrypha Deuterocanonical books. Those are the books that the Catholic and Orthodox churches have in their Bible because they were from the Septuagint, the ancient Greek Bible, but they're not used by modern rabbinic Jews or by Protestant Christians. Um, Christians often interpret the Old Testament in the light of their belief that Jesus is the Messiah and the Son of God. So they have a different hermeneutic or system of interpretation than Jews, even when they're looking at the same scriptures. The New Testament includes 27 written documents of Christians from the first century AD. Most of the writers were Jewish, but they wrote in Greek, which was the common language of the Eastern Roman Empire at the time. So you can divide the books of the New Testament into four main parts. The Gospels, or stories of the life and teachings of Jesus, those are the ones attributed to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The Acts of the Apostles, that's a book written by the author of the Gospel of Luke. It recounts the history of the first 30 years of the church. There's a section of letters or epistles, 13 of Paul eight of other early Christians, and then there's the Revelation of John, which describes the persecution of the church under the Roman Empire and also gives prophecies about the end of times and the second coming of Jesus when he will establish the kingdom of heaven. So the role of the Bible is disagreed upon by Christians, um, but it's regarded in general as the word of God. So most Christians regard all the books of the Bible as written by humans, but as inspired by God, and thus the word of God in some sense. Jesus is also identified as the word or logos in Greek of God made flesh. So he's often um, 
identified with or regarded as particularly closely related to the word of God in the Bible. Among Catholics and the various types of Orthodox Christians, the Bible is one source of doctrine together with church tradition and authority. They reject sola scriptura or the Protestant view that the Bible is the sole source of doctrines. Among other things, the Catholics and Orthodox churches would point to the fact that the church predates the Bible and they were the authority that um, created the Bible, created the selection of texts regarded as canonical. They would also point to the fact that the Bible itself doesn't teach the doctrine of sola scriptura. But that's one of the main differences between Protestants and other Christians in terms of how they interpret and use the Bible. Um, some Christians believe in biblical inerrancy, the view that everything the Bible says is correct, but um, not all Christians and probably not a majority either. There's many different principles for interpreting the Bible or biblical exegesis. Um, the following set of distinctions is often used by Catholics and some other, you know, older forms of Christianity, but it, it varies. Some Protestants would use this hermeneutic uh, too. So there's the literal interpretation of the Bible, so Bible stories as giving historical events, but there's the allegorical interpretation of the Bible as well, also called typological, where Old Testament stories are regarded as types for the New Testament. So, for example, um, Adam, the first human, is sometimes compared to Christ as a kind of almost opposite type. Adam falls to sin, but Christ, the new man, is able to save everyone. Mary is also sometimes called the new Eve. Another example with regards to the role of Mary in Catholicism, she's often compared to the Ark of the Covenant, so the Ark of the Covenant was a vessel that the ancient Israelites used to store the word of God, the tablets on which the commandments were written that had been given to Moses. And Mary carries Jesus, the word of God, in her. So there's lots of examples like that, including, but a lot of them especially relate to the role of Jesus as Messiah. There's also the moral or tropological interpretation of the Bible, where you try to draw specific moral rules or teachings about how one should act. And then finally, there's the anagogical uh, interpretation of the scripture, and this is relating it to eschatology, uh, the afterlife or the end of days that, where um, God will render a last judgment upon people. Christ will come back, the second coming, to judge the living and the dead, and then um, the righteous will be in the kingdom of heaven, the wicked will be thrown into hell or death. Chapter 39, Beliefs. So first, it's good to distinguish and relate Christianity to Judaism. Christianity originated as a sect of Judaism, and Christians do share many beliefs with Jews. Monotheism, the belief there's only one God who's creator and lord of the universe, and he's all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good. Humans are made in the image of God in some sense. Humans have rebelled against God and will be judged by God. God is a righteous judge, but also gracious and merciful. God revealed himself to the nation of Israel and called them his chosen people. God provided the law and the Torah as a rule of conduct for his people. God will send a Messiah to restore the kingdom of Israel. So they have a lot in common. Nevertheless, there is a huge difference, or many huge differences, between the Christians and Jews. Christians regard Jesus as the Messiah, the Son of God, whereas Jews do not. Most Christians regard Jesus as God, one of the persons of the Holy Trinity. Jews expected the Messiah to overthrow Rome and other enemies of the Jews and to establish a kingdom on earth. Jesus said that his kingdom was not of this world, it was a heavenly kingdom. Jesus also taught that his kingdom was for all humans, not just the Jews. So Jesus' death is also an important uh, principle for Christian belief. Jesus' death is generally seen as a sacrifice to atone for the sins of humans. And sinfulness is interpreted as separation from God and as death. All three of those are going together, or there are three different ways of talking about the same thing. Jesus' death is supposed to enable humans to reconcile with God. 
And there's also a view that the temple had to be destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD, which Christians think uh, Jesus predicted, because the temple was made obsolete by Jesus' own sacrifice. His sacrifice on the cross was a one-time animal, uh, sorry, a blood offering to God that would atone for the sins of all humans if they participated in it by adopting this kind of uh, spirit of sacrifice themselves. Um, Jesus became the Passover, the Paschal Lamb, to be offered up to God. And Christians often think that Jesus' sacrifice is reenacted or at least commemorated at every Christian communion ceremony, uh, the Eucharist. So the gospel or the good news is that Jesus Christ has died for the sins and the salvation of humanity. Um, so Christians divide the Bible between the Old Testament and the New. This is also related to their understanding of Christ's uh, mission and his death and resurrection. Testament basically means covenant. So Christians don't believe they have to follow the Old Testament, the Old Covenant that was given to the nation of Israel. They believe Jesus' life, death, uh, and resurrection created a new testament or a new covenant for them to follow. So Christians follow the teachings of Paul in his letters in this regard and the revelations to the apostles in Jerusalem described in the book of Acts. They reject the law of the Old Testament, all the covenants, or sorry, all the um, commandments given to the Israelites, including dietary commandments like not um, eating pork or not uh, mixing uh, dairy and meat. And they replace works, obedience to the law, with justification through faith. That's one of the major themes of Paul's letters. Most Christians cease to practice circumcision, dietary restrictions, Jewish festivals, and most of the other commandments of the Old Testament. This, by the way, made it easier for Gentiles to convert to Christianity. So, like if you were an adult Gentile male, uh, if you had to become Jewish before becoming Christian, then you would have to undergo the ritual of circumcision, removing the foreskin of the penis, which I'm sure would have dissuaded a lot of ancients from converting. But Christianity started as a sect of Judaism, and it eventually evolved into a global missionary religion within a generation or two. Baptism replaced circumcision as the mark of membership in the Christian community. So this is a ritual washing with water, which signifies the believer receiving the Holy Spirit. And then the Lord's Supper, also called the communion, the Eucharist or the Mass, is the communal meal of bread and wine, which recalls Jesus' last supper before his death and sacrifice to save humanity from sin and death. The resurrection is very important to Christian belief. Jesus' resurrection was God's vindication of Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, and as the Son of God. Christians looked forward to the second coming of Jesus and the general day of judgment and the establishment of the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. So they believed that eventually everyone will be resurrected from the dead and that's when the righteous will experience the kingdom of heaven and the wicked will experience destruction or possibly eternal torment. There's different interpretations of hell. But Jesus' resurrection also helped convince most Christians that Jesus was the incarnation of God, one of the persons of the Holy Trinity, and not just you know, like a human prophet or something like that. Christians regard Jesus as Lord or King. They regard Christ as the head of the mystical body of the church. And Christians seek to die to sin and their old self, to follow the example of Jesus, to offer their own life up in sacrifice, to be united to Jesus. And that's how they participate in the sacrifice of the Eucharist with Jesus, even though the um, crucifixion was God offering himself up to himself in sacrifice. Part of how it appears to save people from sin, at least according to the Christian view, is if they have that spirit of self-sacrifice when they partake of the communion it's that offering up of themselves that helps give them salvation 
So the Holy Spirit was important for the birth of the church. It's another important part of Christian belief. So the festival of Pentecost, Pentecost celebrates when the Holy Spirit was given to the Christian apostles and disciples in Jerusalem. And Jesus called the Holy Spirit the advocate or paraclete that would come after him. Christians believe they're all meant to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit at their baptism, and they regard that as a second birth, being born again or being born from above, depending on how you translate um, that passage from the gospel. The Holy Spirit is also widely believed by Christians to give gifts like healing, laying on of hands, prophecy, or speaking in tongues, although generally only charismatic Christians still practice those um, things today. The Holy Spirit can also be seen as the personal agent of God in the lives of individual Christians and the Christian community. So a lot of Christians, even ones who aren't Pentecostal, they regard the Holy Spirit as kind of like active in terms of being a guide, whether for the individuals or, or the church. And this is just to emphasize or underline that the Holy Spirit is believed by Christians to be one of the three persons of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all of which are co-equal and fully God. So despite the points of agreement, there have been many doctrinal disputes in the history of Christianity. So in terms of theology, some Christians, like some of the ancient Aryan Christians, denied the full divinity of Jesus or otherwise subordinated Jesus to the Father. Um, Trinitarianism is the common Christian doctrine that God is one being in three persons, but Arianism was the view that Christ is a created being not truly co-equal with the Father. So different Christians have also uh, have different Christologies or theories of the nature of Jesus. So the Orthodox view shared by Catholics and Eastern Orthodox churches is that Jesus is one person with two natures, human and divine. Um, the Monophysite view is that Jesus has only one nature, divine. Uh, Miaphysitism is the official doctrine um, of the uh, Oriental Orthodox churches. And they say that Jesus has one nature that's both human and divine. Um, soteriology or theory of salvation can also differ. So for example, the Protestants see themselves as having a different theory of salvation from the Catholic Church. That justification, which is basically referring here to um, being justified in the sense of being saved from sin, is through faith alone, not through works, like the Eucharist or any other thing you might do. Whereas the Catholic Church, um, their soteriology is often described as justification through faith and works, that those can somehow go together or maybe be operating with each other simultaneously. Maybe works are the manifestation or fruit of faith. There's a lot of different ways of putting it and debating it. Some of this is what distinguishes the different churches from each other. Um, the Eucharist or Lord's Supper also has different interpretations. So um, what's often called transubstantiation is the view that bread and wine are completely changed into the body and blood of Jesus. Their substance changes. Um, consubstantiation is the view that there's the real presence of Jesus in the bread and wine, but they retain that um, their original substance of bread and wine while also receiving the divine substance. So they go together with consubstantiation. Memorialism is the view of the uh, Calvinist churches and many others in the Protestant tradition that the bread and wine are just symbolic representations of Jesus's body and blood that commemorate his sacrifice on the cross, but that he's not literally present in the Eucharist. Um, there's also different theories of atonement or like how it is that Christ's sacrifice saves all humanity. Um, we'll just go through a few of these. The ransom view is that Christ gave his own life as a ransom to Satan, who was owed the lives of sinners. This was a view of some of the um, ancient church fathers. The recapitulation view is that Christ succeeded where Adam had failed, undoing the fall of man. So this is when Adam was tempted by the serpent in the garden and fell prey to sin. So Christ is recreating this somehow, recapitulating it, but succeeding where Adam failed, leading humans to eternal life and perfection. The satisfaction view of the atonement is that God's justice demands that all sins be paid for, but humans are fallen and unable to pay for their sins. So God uh, 
manifest, you might say, as Christ, sacrifices himself and thus paid for human sin. And the penal substitution view is that Christ was punished in the place of humans. The Nicene Creed developed after the councils of Nicaea, and it's believed in by the vast majority of Christians, including Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestants. So it affirmed the Trinitarian theology. Um, it uh, has a theory of the incarnation. Jesus is the incarnation of God. He's not just human or a prophet. Um, it describes the crucifixion, crucifixion, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Uh, it says that Christ will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. So this is the doctrines of the second coming of Jesus. Even though he died on the cross, he will come again on earth. Uh, there will be a day of judgment of the living and the dead, and Jesus will then establish the kingdom of heaven, which will go on forever. The Nicene Creed also affirms there's only one Catholic or universal and apostolic church. Apostolic means it's descended of descended from the apostles, the original followers and teachers of Jesus. And it also affirms one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. Chapter 40, Worship and Festivals. The most important Christian ceremony is generally the Eucharist, also called the Lord's Supper or Communion. It's the central part of Christian worship in most churches, except some Protestant churches like some evangelicals. Jesus initiated the Eucharist at his Last Supper. So it's referring back to the meal where he identifies the bread that's being eaten by his disciples as his body and the wine that's being drunk as his blood. And so it's a way for Christians to participate in the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross in order to save them from sin. The early church held the Eucharist within a larger love feast called the Agape. So it was more of a full meal but modern Christians generally have it as a small uh, ritual or ceremonial meal. The Eucharist is usually given on its own, just with the bread and wine. The Eucharist can be taken daily or weekly, uh, generally on Sundays, which is the Christian day of worship. The early generation of Christians uh, I also practiced the Jewish Sabbath in addition to Sunday or the Lord's Day. The reason why Christians usually worship on Sunday is because that's the day that they believe that Jesus was resurrected. Baptism is the Christian rite of initiation. Um, in ancient Greece and Rome, there were mystery religions that often had secret ceremonies that you had to undergo in order to be considered a member of the religion. But unlike the mystery religions, the Christian baptism ritual was simple and it was not a secret. The early church also practiced infant baptism, although some Protestant churches think that it should only be practiced by adults. Churches which practice infant baptism also have a separate confirmation ceremony when a baptized member of the church comes of age. The early church's liturgy involved worship on the Lord's Day, Sunday, not only on the Jewish Sabbath. Psalms and hymns were sung. There was laying on of hands uh, to commission missionaries and elders and deacons. There was anointing of the sick and prayer for the sick. And money was collected for other poorer churches in need. This is all described in the letters of Paul and some of the other texts of the New Testament. There's there was less of a strict distinction between worship and the business of the church. That's one of the differences between the early church liturgy and that of other later churches. A lot of early Christians had to worship uh, in secret catacombs, like you can see here. In part, this was to evade persecution by the Roman government. In the post-apostolic era, the church developed some new features. So there was more of a proliferation of types of clergy, bishops, presbyters or priests and deacons. The bishops provided over a local church of a city. They wrote Eucharistic prayers and homilies, which were sometimes collected in books, some of which have survived today. The diocese is the term for the territory of a bishop, the area over which they have authority. The priests or presbyters were assistants of the bishop in a diocese, um, and then the deacons were assistants to a bishop or to a priest. 
a lot of the early churches were in people's homes. This could be called a home church or a house church. Later, purpose-built church structures were made. An example of a relatively early church is Santa Sabina in Rome, which dates to the 5th century AD. Um, these are some of the main annual festivals in Christianity. There's the Lenten season, or Lent, that leads up to Passover. Passover is called Easter in English. In most other European languages or just other Christian languages, it's called something based on the Hebrew word Pesach. So, for example, it's often known as Pasha or Pascha. So this is the Christian version of Passover, but it celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. The date varies from year to year based on the Jewish lunar calendar. Um, Ascension celebrates when Jesus appeared for the last time as a resurrected body and ascended to heaven. Pentecost is 50 days after Easter and celebrates the descent of the Holy Spirit upon the apostles. This is when the Christian church is regarded as having begun. Later in the year is October 31st, which is All Hallows Eve. It's the evening before All Saints Day, November 1st, which is celebrated um, to honor all of the saints, all the people that are kind of like publicly acknowledged by the church as having um, gone to heaven or having attained uh, sanctity. Uh, and then November 2nd is All Souls Day. This is like in Catholicism when people pray for the souls in purgatory, those who are saved but are not completely saints or sanctified. Um, and then the next big festival is Christmas. And before Christmas is Advent, which is the season that leads up to it. Christmas is this, uh, celebrated on December 25th, which is traditionally regarded as the birth of Jesus, although it's not stated in the gospel. And then January 6th is the Feast of Epiphany. Um, there's also Death Days of Martyrs or Feast Days of Saints. And this is more of a thing in the Catholic and Orthodox churches. Um, the Peace of Constantine in 313 AD meant that the persecution of Christians in the Roman Empire came to an end. This enabled Christians to worship more freely and that led to more large-scale church building. A lot of the early churches were modeled after um, Roman basilicas, so they're kind of like long hall type chambers uh, with the altar at one end and often a colonnade or row of columns with arches in between them. Other important developments in the early church was the development of Christian monasticism. These were Christians who renounced all their wealth, renounced society, went to live in poverty and simplicity in the desert or wilderness typically, and would spend their lives in prayer. So these included the desert fathers who went to the Egyptian desert. So St. Anthony the Great was one of their leaders and founders. And also some of the Cappadocian fathers that include saints like St. Gregory of Nyssa. Um, these were people who lived at least part of their life as ascetics or renunciates. So they live in poverty, in chastity, in humility, simplicity. Um, they eventually gathered into communities that would be led by an elder monk, a father, or abbot. Um, and later on, there developed uh, female monastic communities as well, um, communities of nuns. So uh, some monks are also ordained as priests, but um, in Catholic and Orthodox Christianity, there's no female clergy. So none of the nuns, even though they live as monastics or contemplatives, those are people who devote their life to prayer. They are not going to be ordained clergy. So lay people only received communion on Easter in the early church, not every day or every Sunday. But that's no longer the case like in the churches that um, have Eucharist as a regular thing. Monasticism spread to both um, Western and Eastern Mediterranean. So uh, basically all of the Catholic and Orthodox churches would have orders of monks, but none of the Protestant churches do. With actually the recent exception of the Anglican church, they've brought back um, contemplative orders. I think that happened in the late 20th century. So uh, in terms of reform, this introduced a lot of new denominations, a lot of new churches, in other words, divisions of Christianity a lot of new practices and beliefs. 
the Orthodox churches, all the various types in the East, never had a Reformation, and they have a more traditional liturgy um, and other practices. Sunday worship in Protestant churches often focuses on the sermon by the minister and not the Eucharist. In Lutheran churches, there are singing of hymns by the whole congregation that accompany the prayers and the liturgy of the word. Liturgy of the word is reading out part of the Bible. Um, in the Church of England, the liturgy remains similar in structure to the Roman Catholic liturgy, but in the English language, as opposed to Latin. The Anabaptists were quite radical, and they often just expressed personal piety in prayer. The Quakers, that nickname comes from the fact that they would shake as they were filled with the Holy Spirit when they worshipped God. Uh, the Catholic and Protestant liturgy tended to be solemn and led by a priest or minister. The liturgical movement in the 20th century uh, emphasized active participation by lay people and services that were more understandable. So this manifested in the Catholic Church in the Second Vatican Council, recommending changes to the Catholic liturgy, such as replacing the Latin language with uh, vernacular languages, the, the language that was spoken by members of the congregation. And uh, they made other significant changes during and after the Second Vatican Council, such as traditionally in Catholic churches, the Eucharist would be offered by the priest ad orientum, which means facing the altar of God. So it's being offered to God, which is the original meaning of the Eucharist. It's God's sacrifice to himself reenacted um, through this new um, element of body and blood, bread and wine. But in the post uh, Second Vatican Council Eucharist, the elements of the Eucharist, the bread and wine, are presented to the congregation, to the lay people. Pentecostalism, as mentioned, is this branch of Protestant Christianity, this movement that's really interested in experiencing the Holy Spirit. Um, so the release of feelings is very common in Pentecostal um, gatherings, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecies, ministries of healing. So people will go up to be healed, often by the, the uh, minister or the pastor or the leader of the ceremony. It originated in the U.S., as previously mentioned, but by now it's spread worldwide, very popular in parts of Latin America and Africa. Chapter 41, Contemporary Christianity. So uh, a bit more again about the modern expansion of Christianity. So Europeans were the ones to bring Christianity around much of the world during their age of discovery from the 15th to the 17th centuries. Now there are uh, ancient uh, churches that were already outside of Europe, like in Egypt, the Middle East, India. Um, but the New World um, and other parts of Africa and Asia, they only got Christianity during this age of discovery. So the Spanish, for example, brought Catholicism to Central America and South America in the 16th century. The Portuguese brought Catholicism to parts of Africa, India, and East Asia in the 16th century, and then also to Brazil in South America. The British brought Protestant Christianity of various types to North America in the 17th century and after. So one example of the um, the bringing of Catholicism to Latin America is Our Lady of Guadalupe, which is an apparition or appearance of the Virgin Mary um, in Guadalupe, Mexico in 1531. So Juan Diego was uh, a Mexican Indian convert to Catholicism, and he had this vision of Mary. So this is a significant event because it represents the Catholic belief that Mary manifested to the new world to help establish Christianity there. And the image that's shown in this picture, the image itself is believed to have been at least partly miraculously created. In Africa, Christianity has been there since antiquity, both in the Coptic Church in Egypt 
and the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. Those are some of the earliest Christian churches. But most of Africa was either Muslim in the north or in sub-Saharan Africa. They practiced various forms of animism or other indigenous religions with some pockets of Islam. But since the 19th century, European colonial powers brought Catholicism and various kinds of Protestantism. And then more recently, uh, Pentecostal Christianity in particular has grown very rapidly in sub-Saharan Africa in the 20th century. In this slide is a picture of Pentecostals in Nigeria. In Asia, I mentioned the ancient uh, churches in India, those are the so-called St. Thomas Christians. They believe that their church was founded by the Apostle Thomas, who traveled to India to bring the church there in antiquity. Later on, the Portuguese in the 14 and 1500s brought Catholicism, and later still in the 17 and 1800s, the British brought various Protestant churches like Methodism and Presbyterianism. The Philippines uh, were Catholic since the Spanish conquered them and brought their religion there. Um, in China, there were some ancient Christian churches connected to the Church of the East, or the so-called Nestorian churches. That was a form of Christianity brought along the Silk Road. Um, so that is an ancient trade route that went from East Asia through Central Asia to Baghdad and parts of the Middle East and the West. So there was a lot of travel there, so it was easy for Christian missionaries to travel along that route and bring Christianity as they went. But the Church of the East actually died out in China at some point. Um, and so there were some Catholic and Protestant converts from waves of Western missionaries that started in the 15 and 1600s with the Jesuits. But most Chinese remained um, their religion traditional religion, which was a mix of Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucianism. Uh, and Western Christian missionaries were expelled after the communist takeover of China in 1949. After the death of Mao Zedong, the persecution of Christianity started to lessen somewhat, and there were various forms of Christianity, including evangelical, Pentecostal, Protestant denominations, Catholicism, that started to spread. By now, there's around 20 million Christians in China today, but the numbers are somewhat difficult to determine. Um, in addition to the churches officially recognized by the Chinese government, there are some home churches, uh, most of which are illegal because they're not officially registered with the state, but they want to kind of preserve their independence from government regulation. In South Korea, Christianity is the largest religion, including both Catholicism and various Protestant churches. Protestant Christianity was brought by missionaries, for example, from the United States in the 19th through the 20th centuries. In terms of the world, uh, as mentioned before, Europe has largely de-Christianized and secularized, although there's a kind of vestigial Christian identity in parts of Europe, and there are some people who still practice. In the United States, Christianity is more common than in Europe, but it has still declined. There has been a growth of evangelical and Pentecostal Christianity since they were uh, formed in the 19th and 20th centuries. Since World War II, evangelical and Pentecostal are the only type of Christianity that's really spread and grown in the United States. There's been a decline of all the other mainline Protestant denominations like the Lutherans, the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, and the Methodists. Catholic Christianity has also declined, but not quite as much as the mainline Protestant denominations. In Latin America, the Catholic Church is still strong, but Pentecostal Christianity has also grown at the expense of Catholicism. And in the so-called Global South, Christianity remains quite strong in Latin America and Africa and in parts of Asia. The most vibrant and growing Christian communities are often from the Global South, not from Europe or North America. Although some of the largest evangelical megachurches are still in the United States, like Saddleback Church in uh, California. Although I'm pretty sure the largest in absolute terms megachurches are in Nigeria. Some of them have well over 20,000 members, for example, and they have like small cities that have grown up around them. So that's it for our summary of Christianity. Uh, we covered a lot, but a lot was not covered. 
some things were kind of oversimplified. So my apologies if there were any small errors or just kind of like gross oversimplifications, but hopefully at least somewhat helpful. Next up, we're moving on to part nine, Islam. Until next time.